So good morning. Uh, my name is Susan Heyman. I am with a company called Enviro Issues, and we are providing the facilitation support uh, and other meeting support um, for uh, not only today's meeting, but we did for yesterday and for this whole series of sagebrush conservation uh, stakeholder online workshops. So really glad that you are here with us today. Um, today's focus is on case studies, uh, examples of successful collaborative approaches. And before I say much more about that, um, except for pointing out, please, at the bottom of your screen, you see a phone number there uh, for Liz Mack. And Liz is, uh, works with me at Enviro Issues, and she is providing um, technical hosting support today. So if you have any technical issues during um, the presentation today, please write down that phone number just in case, 210-269. 5524 and you can call or text Liz and she can give you a hand. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Brian. Uh, Brian uh, Nesvik is the director of Wyoming Game and Fish and is providing our opening and welcome. Brian? Hey, thank you very much, Susan. And first, I just want to say I'm glad that uh, that Wafa and Tom and, and San and crew were able to and all the other folks that have um, invested into making this thing work um, in a much different environment than we planned several months ago. I, I, I applaud them for pulling this off even, even under some challenging um, circumstances. I think we're all learning how to do um, these kind of virtual meetings a little bit better. Maybe it's going to serve us down the road to, um, to be able to help us. I, I'm hoping in ways to be more efficient, but I, I do regret the fact that we're not able to all be in the same room at the same place and and be able to discuss these issues in person. So I really, um, you know, one of the things that certainly is in my purview and, and something that my constituents and my department expected me is to look long-term. And, and so, you know, I look at a lot of these types of conferences through the lens of, of um, are we being purposeful and looking at what um, we're doing today that's gonna help us um, with planning and with policy and with the long term being able to provide the resources to those folks that are out on the ground and actually doing the work that is so important we're going to talk about here today and that, that you all talked about yesterday and looking at the topics you have here i think um i think you hit the mark i think that you know looking at places where we've enjoyed some success and using those as models is the is what the right model should look like for um for looking at the future and making sure that we synchronize our efforts both with with um, stuff that's happening on the ground with field work and, the, and the, all the way up to the most senior policy level decisions that we make related to these issues. You know, and um, I will tell you that from my perspective, there's a lot of issues that are biting at our ankles today, but when I think about the most pressing long-term um, issues for wildlife conservation, um, what we're, we're talking about here today, at least in the West, is in the top three for sure. Um, it's certainly very important in my state. I think that um, it's important from both a rangeland health perspective as well as a wildlife perspective. Certainly in, you know, in, in our state and many of other states in the, in the West, um, you know, significant portions of our states are dominated by sagebrush, sagebrush landscapes that are unique and there's a lot of wildlife species, wildlife species that are cornerstones to what we do every day and what um, are are important to our constituents, you know, that, that rely on sagebrush ecosystems. So I think this is great. Um, th this is a great way to focus efforts on things that are really important today, most important issues today for the West. Um, you know, in our state, we're looking real hard at invasives. I look at, you know, the one of the things that I wish we could go back in time and, and um, change is the way that we deal, dealt with invasives 70 years ago. And um, I think that we would be dealing with a different set of challenges today if we had done that. And so I think your work today on and, and talking about um, invasive species, you know, particularly the three big um, invasive annual grasses is really important. Um, I will tell you that if I look at what, you know, what are the potential policy level outcomes of this kind of work, um, first of all, I think that it provides a basis for um, all decision makers from all the different stakeholders, all the different 
um, governmental entities as well as NGOs and, and industry and, and all involved. It's, a, it's an opportunity for folks to synchronize their efforts, both between field work and, and policy work. I think just you know continued increased awareness is another potential outcome of what um, what these kind of conferences do for us. We recently had a great um, one day meeting that that focused on a lot of these similar issues um, a few months ago in Monterey, California, and and you know when I when I, I look at each time we conduct one of those meetings and we evaluate the latest and greatest and the most updated information. I, I see progression in um, identifying new messages to help people become more aware of what, how important this really is. Because I, I don't think I don't think we've hit the mark there yet. I think it's really. Um, I, I think that within our group, I think we're um, folks get it. I think outside of our group, we got some challenges. Um, I do think that you know the the work that that these kind of another potential positive outcome for these kind of summits is to provide some talking points, messaging, and some focus for funding. And so I'm hopeful that um, is another outcome. And then, you know, it does, um, it provides some more baseline information for groups like WAFWA and Intermountain Joint, Intermountain West Joint Venture and, and others to, um, to focus their efforts on and projects and, and project approvals. So anyway, um, this is certainly a, a priority for WAFWA. It's certainly a priority for my state, Wyoming. We've, um, invested significantly in it already and, and plan to do more. And um, I do think it's this is one of those that for the long term is is really important. Even when we've got short term issues that are, um, like I said, biting in our ankles and competing for funding, I think this is a thing that we need, we've got to maintain some long term focus on despite um, even the most dire of challenges today with funding. So with that, I thank all of you for your investment here. Um, I wish that you could have come to our state during spring. It's it's a beautiful time of the year here for those of you that have been here before, um, but there'll be some more opportunity in the future. And I think, Susan, um, you wanted me to, to, at this point, introduce Bob. Is that correct? Actually, if you could hold that introduction for just a minute, Brian, I'll circle back to you. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Really appreciate your opening remarks. And uh, again, we'll, we will circle back to you here in just a minute. Um, so again, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Susan Heyman here. And I'd like to introduce just a couple other uh, folks that are going to be helping me today uh, with this and also with this overall online workshop. Uh, also with Enviro Issues, I mentioned Liz Mack. And again, Liz is our technical host and co-facilitator, so please uh, reach out to her if you have any technical issues. Um, Candace Plendel uh, is also on the team. She's supporting the workshops and uh, can be reached as well. Uh, Candace will also be helping us put uh, documentation together for uh, today's meeting. Uh, Jackie Dagger and Janelle Hull have really been leading, uh, pulling the presentations together um, from the presenters, making those accessible for folks. Uh, and then uh, really leading the online engagement, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, and we'll all be involved in the breakout groups that occur next week, so very excited um, uh, to help with that. And I also just want to mention right now we have uh, 112 participants, and that includes our speakers, but um, that's a really good group of folks, and we're, we are certainly very glad uh, to have you here. So just a couple of things, and many of you, if not all of you, were with us yesterday, so apologies if there's a repeat here, but just want to mention this so that everyone is comfortable using this Zoom environment. Uh, first of all, I want to make you aware that we are recording today's meeting, and we will be posting a link of that, uh, of this meeting, to our website, and we'll provide that uh, website link. It will actually be provided to you in the question and answer uh, pane that I will speak to here in just a minute. Um, again, attendees will be muted uh, throughout the meeting unless called upon by me. Um, and we're going to ask that uh, attendees, when we do ask for any questions, if you could please raise your hand. And let me show you where that is if you're not familiar. At the bottom of the screen, and your screen should look like mine right now, there's a raise hand. If you click on that, uh, we'll get an indication. A little electronic hand will pop up. 
and then we'll call on you uh, and we will unmute you so that you're able to ask your question. If you would rather submit a question in writing, uh, you're welcome to do that using this uh, little Q&A uh, panel at the bottom. And when you click that, uh, this kind of a, a box will open up. You can just type in your question and you can send it to us anonymously or it will be identified by however you signed in today. Um, one thing about, uh, you're certainly welcome to submit these anonymously, but if we do have your name, what's handy is that if we get pressed for time and we're not able to get to all the questions, we can definitely circle back with you or have the speaker circle back with you. So whatever you prefer to do, um, but this is another option. Uh, you do control your own sound. So if, if some of the speakers are too quiet or um, we do have a video today we'll be showing and once we run that video, that might actually be a little bit loud. So please just maintain whatever control you need and have your sound set as comfortably as possible. Um, so for today, again, reminder, if you have any technical difficulties, please reach out to Liz. Um, we did have several people contact us yesterday. Uh, it was very helpful, I think, for them to be able to reach Liz and we were able to take care of those issues very quickly. So if you do have any, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you see on the screen here, this is the link we have to our sagebrush conservation workshop.participate.online. That's our online engagement site. We will post that link in the Q&A panel so that you're able to actually get to that on screen. So our agenda, and I won't read it to you here, but um, I do want to just point out a couple of things. You all should have this agenda. Um, one thing that's kind of important to note is that we will take a five minute pause or a five minute break at the top of the hour. Um, we have found that's just very helpful to give people a chance to step away from their computer screens for a minute, um, refill their coffee, get a glass of water, whatever it is they need, and then we'll get back going again. I will give you a little bit of a heads up uh, when we're ready to begin. So if you have your sound still up, you'll be able to hear us uh, before we actually get started. Um, today's, today's session really is focused on thinking about all of the interesting and, and good work that's going on in the sagebrush biome and possibly what we might learn from that and apply to problem solving some of the, the issues that still exist in the sagebrush conservation world. Um, so really invite you to be thinking about that. That's really our purpose today. Um, and on this agenda, the, the presenters here are all you know, they are the people that are leading or passionate about these case studies that they are presenting. So we really appreciate their time. Uh, we appreciate their expertise and look forward to hearing from them. They have some very engaging slides. The presentations will last generally between 15 and possibly to 20 minutes. And then we, we do hope to have five minutes or so for questions at the end of those, but we will hold questions until the end. And I think that is all I need to say about uh, about all of those details. So with that, I would like to turn this over to Tom Remington. Uh, Tom is uh, our, our host with the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And Tom, would you like to uh, take, take the helm here? Yeah, thank you, Susan. I just wanted to spend a few minutes um, sort of introducing these case studies and, and how we got here and how they fit in. The case studies originated with the Increasing Capacity for Conservation, Sagebrush Conservation Work Group, which Ali Duvall has been heading up for actually a couple of years now. And the take home message from yesterday, uh, I think was we have a lot of work to do. Um, and we need more capacity for conservation in virtually every dimension, whether it's funding, uh, boots on the ground, uh, communication, networking, et cetera. Um, and so we, as, as a committee, we looked at um, so where are examples across the West of how people are increasing capacity at local scales. And as a community of conservationists, we all face similar challenges across the biome, but our approaches differ substantially and we can learn from each other. So the idea here is to present some of these um, novel collaborative approaches um, they say there's no new ideas, but the reality is um, there are repackaging of old ones if there aren't new ones, but good ideas and good programs, implementing good ideas, turning them into good programs 
and good groups are, are surprisingly rare. And we tend to view them as obvious and inevitable if and after they succeed. Um, for instance, of course, the Utah Watershed Restoration Initiative is funding, funding locally submitted restoration proposals. Uh, they always have. Well, somebody had that idea once and actually turned it into a program. And you think, of course, the Sage Grouse Initiative is a key component of the Farm Bill. And of course, it works on public and private lands. Um, but that wasn't inevitable. Somebody had that idea and somebody turned it into reality. So we want, one of the things I want to uh, emphasize is look at these case studies for what they are and what they do, but think about what they represent. Um, it's really, um, they're all examples in di very different ways of local control of local problems um, and collaboration uh, ac across um, a lot of different scales and, and NGOs and, and ranchers and industry and and agencies and, and government is really supporting those efforts in most cases as opposed to making them happen. And I think that's a, a place we need to get to because government is not going to be able to do this alone. Um, so th these specific programs may be plug and play. You may be able to take the Rangeland Fire Protection Association model and, and plug it into your state, but the collaborative approach to that problem and the local control and local ownership and the idea of um, divest the state actually sharing executive authority and responsibility. The firefighting is a state and federal responsibility. It's not a rancher responsibility. But in that case, they shared that executive power and authority with stakeholders. Uh, you'll hear about the Wyoming stage grouse implementation team and, and various facets of that, including the um, lo local groups um, that are restored, the Douglas Core Area Restoration Team. That's another place where uh, regulatory authority was shared by government uh, with stakeholders. Um, that's not the model you see in every Western state. So, so don't just look at the very specific details of the programs, look at what they represent, and that's probably more transplantable to your particular situation. Um, than, the, than the specific details of the program. So anyway, uh, just wanted to sort of make those points. I wanna thank the speakers um, as well today. Really appreciate your time. I think we're, we're all gonna benefit. I'm really excited to hear about uh, some of these things that I've read about, but really don't understand the details of. So back to you, Susan, thanks. All right, thanks very much, Tom. Uh, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and go back to Brian. And Brian, if you would uh, please introduce our first speaker. There we are. I think I'm unmuted. All right. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it, even though Bob probably won't, Susan. Um, anyway, <laughs> Bob Budd is uh, is is well known in Wyoming as the director of the Wyoming Nat. Wyoming Wildlife Natural Resources Trust, which was a, a really cool um, idea that, that began over a decade ago now in Wyoming to um, take and build a pretty good corpus that would be used, the interest could be used on an annual basis to fund um, wildlife projects around the state. And when I say wildlife projects, I mean really focused on the ground kind of projects. And Bob has been at the helm um, since day one and has done an exceptional job with that. He's also um, continues and has been since its inception, the, um, the director, the, the chairman of the Sage Grouse Implementation Team, which is the, um, the, the body that Tom was just discussing about, you know, a, a governing body that makes some decisions that really drives the ship with um, coordinating all of the different entities that are involved in in either effects of potential listing by sage grouse or that it's interested in managing and conserving sage grouse across the state. Bob's been involved in, in the effort that the core area strategy development and the now well over a decade old um, plan that we've implemented in our state, three different governor executive orders, um, actually more than three executive orders focused on sage grouse now, but, but with three different governors, um, he's been um, on, the, on the leading edge of all of those efforts. 
and certainly knows a lot. He's a, he's a subject matter expert with regards to policy and sagebrush rangelands as well as sage grouse. Um, he does, you know, before that he had a ranching background. He's been a land manager at a large ranch in Wyoming. Um, and like I said, he's a sagebrush expert. He's, he's, um, he's a pretty smart guy actually. But what I will tell you is, is that he's out, he's actually just a, a terrible fisherman. And he's one of those fishermen who likes to use his, um, his fish finder really only to his benefit. And what he does is, is he tries to move the boat right over the top of, of where the fish are so that his line is where the fish are and nobody else gets to catch any fish. And he still doesn't catch any. His wife is actually though, um, luckily a very good fisherman. So it's good to go um, fishing with Bob and his wife because at least his wife knows what she's doing and can get things done. She's also really smart too. She's actually quite a bit smarter than Bob. But anyway, Bob, um, I'm sure we'll have some great things to say here today, and I look forward to listening to him. Okay, Bob, Bob over to you. Uh, good morning, and the only thing I'm not sure about is how to advance the slides, Susan. Is it a click will work? Uh, I'm actually going to advance them for you just so that we can uh, make sure that we keep everything together. So if you just say next, then I okay, will make next. sure to do that. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, but I just as a reminder, what led to this type of an approach for management and, and uh, policy on, on a species? Uh, you had a species that was ubiquitous in Wyoming. It, uh, it was uh, wide ranging, uh, very, very different kind of critter. A lot of things we knew and a lot of things we didn't. You had the Endangered Species Act overlay. And so people rose up. We had the first meeting in 2007 uh, in Casper and thought we'd get, you know, 50 or 60 sagebrush, uh, sagebrushophiles, if you will. Uh, we had well over 250 people at that meeting in Casper. And uh, that was what led to the creation of the SIGIT, the Sage Grouse Implementation Team. Next. The basics on Sage Grouse, again, I don't need to go through all the details, but you have the issue of fidelity. You have whether they're local or migratory. You've got habitat preferences that range across the sagebrush uh, ecotone. They got, you know, they're a landscape species and, and they're hardwired success strategies may not be totally suited to today. Next. We also overlap with 73 other species of greatest environmental concern. Uh, nearly a third of species of concern are in our sage grouse conservation efforts. And later as we got into this, that was one of the things we started to investigate was the how much uh, overlap there was and whether what we were doing for sage grouse was beneficial to those other species. So that brought in a completely different group of people who had an interest in the outcome with sage grouse. Next. So our strategy was pretty simple. It's conserve populations and habitats uh, where we can have the most effect. Um, obviously that's, that's the core areas. We wanted to maintain our economic opportunity, uh, particularly where we had minimal conflicts. We wanted a sound ecological and economic model for conservation. And we wanted to include major stakeholders in the decision-making process. And that last one is the one that really set then Governor Friedenthal off. He, he cornered me after the Casper meeting and said, we need solutions. We don't need pretty pap papers and pictures and PowerPoints. He hated PowerPoints. And uh, he said, I, I want solutions. And so uh, Ryan Lance and I noodled around on it a little bit, went back in and said, you know, we think maybe we ought to put together a group of people that has oil and gas, environmental interests, uh, agency people, the whole big deal, had a list of about 26 uh, tribes, you name it. And he looked at me and said, you've lost your mind. He said, if it works, I'm taking full credit. And if not, you're fired. And that was pretty much the way we went from there. So next. The big the process part, I think, is the part Tom really wanted me to get into. And that, that from the get-go, we had all of those different interests involved and engaged. And I underline engage here on the screen because it's really important that they be bought in, but it's also important that they, that they have 
uh, what they bring to the table is, is there for everyone else. We did end up with 26 people. We had two from mining, two from oil and gas, two from agriculture, two from conservation groups. We had all of the federal and state agencies. Uh, we had county government. We had you name it. Uh, and, and it was an open participatory process. We had the 26 seated at the table, but we would have meetings with as many as 150 people in the room, uh, and we allowed them to participate as long as they were polite. One of the key things we learned along the way, or that, that I learned along the way, is that you have to be a learning organization. And when I say that, we spent the first meeting or two, we met about every 10 days for six months to get this done. Um, you had to have uh, we started out with Sage Grouse 101, and, and, and then we did Sage Brush 101. We did all of that, and all of a sudden we hit a brick wall. I mean, you couldn't move an inch. And it occurred to me that one of the problems was we'd never done oil and gas 101. So you had two people at the table, maybe a half a dozen, who actually understood what the process was to go from a lease to exploration to uh, to development, to ultimately production. And so we went back and did Mining 101, Oil and Gas 101, Grazing 101, to make sure everybody was on the same page. Next. We were time controlled. Uh, that was really what was an advantage of having the governors work on this. You'd go in, sit down, and you'd say, well, how soon can you do it? Uh, usually you'd kind of Hedge that, the six months we gave, we said uh, we thought we could do it in six months. He said, well, I'll give you four. Uh, ultimately, we took the six, um, but we, we, had a, we had strict timelines. And, and if you don't, you get a lot of mission drift. But as a chairman, for me to be able to say, guys, we got three more meetings and this is gonna be done, that put people back onto focus. And that was really, really critical. We used a work in progress approach. We didn't keep minutes, we didn't do that. We started with a, uh, an outline for a document that became the executive order, the first one, and now all of them. Um, and we added to it at each meeting or we deleted from it. So we'd get, we'd get to a point, we'd send everybody out, they could review it for about 10 days, you'd go back through. And after you'd cooked it, you know, you'd get one section, it'd be pretty well cooked. And then you didn't need to go back to it. Everybody was happy with it. It's important to note it was not consensus-based as consensus is defined. It was goal-driven and, and we had two things, conserve populations and habitat and allow for development and economic activity. Next. So what were the key things? It, it was to remove or ameliorate threats, the biological base that we had to address. That was number one. Secondly, we had to have adequate regulatory mechanisms to meet the requirements of the ESA and, and, and other laws. And finally, we, we used a three-pronged approach. You avoid, you avoid conflict, avoid impacts. Where you can't do that, you minimize them to the greatest degree possible. And if you still have areas, prior existing rights and other things, where you can't avoid and minimize, or you've done all you can, then you allow mitigation. And mitigation in our state has always been provided ahead of time, and it's always been a habitat provision. Next. Next. We, uh, we used the COT report. I sat on that group uh, uh, when it was developed. We used that as kind of our uh, framework on the, on the habitat side. We looked at what the potential threats were and then evaluated how we could manage each of those. And then on the uh, regulatory side, we ultimately used an executive order because we didn't believe, and I still don't, we could have gotten 90 legislators to sit down and write a technical document like the executive orders are. The regulatory process would have been over 50 state agencies that would have had to adopt identical rules. That probably wasn't gonna happen and voluntary wasn't adequate. Next. We recognized existing rights and that, that got very interesting because as an example, uh, we did not count a lease as an existing right. We only counted a permit. Uh, that was with industry's blessing, um, but it, there were some who came in and as we got new uh, companies, they, they pushed back on that. But ultimately, industry itself was the one that said, no, we're going to self-regulate and we're going to do it right. 
And until you have a permit, we're not going to say you have a right. The reason that was critical in Wyoming is that probably 80% of our state was already leased for something. So if you said that's a prior right and there's no rules, we had no rules. Uh, with mining, we relied on SMACRA with the, um, and until the bird was not a candidate and then we had to go back and, and, and provide state protections on coal, next. So the core area strategy started with the birds we have. Uh, this is a map from Doherty. Uh, you know, I think this is a 208 map. Uh, and we sat down and said, okay, well, where are the birds? And, and that, we, they told us where, where they needed to be. Uh, those areas became areas managed primarily for sage grouse. It was the best of the best. But as we developed it, we wanted to go out and make sure that we had adequate buffers, if you will, or adequate protection, because we knew we were gonna lose some areas that had already been developed. Next. So the high productivity areas that were lost, we, had, we added others in. And you can see on this where, if you look right there at the center right, where we went up and picked up some lesser productive areas, to make up for some that had already been developed. And that's the Powder River Basin. You can see where you've got red that isn't in. That was well developments at spacings of up to, up to four acres. Next. We, this is the valid existing rights. And we looked at that as we had a credible development potential, not just whether or not it might be there. These are well locations at the time we did it. And you can see why we didn't have core area in that upper uh, Northeast corner. Next. Then we, then we went back and analyzed that again based on local knowledge. You can see all of those red uh, polygons. Those were done by Nissa Whitford and myself. And we went in and looked at with aerial photos what the habitat was, whether those needed to be included or not included and, and adjusted there. Next. Then we went and verified this is uh, mapping, habitat mapping, uh, veg mapping that we, we went back and did and looked at whether or not our core areas actually matched up with where the habitat was. And as you can see, that was spot on. Next. So the best available science led us to avoidance minimization and mitigation, and then it built a tolerance understanding. And that was the creation of the density and disturbance calculation tool. And what we did with that is we said, okay, at a level based on the science we had primarily out of Northeast Wyoming with oil and gas, that 5% disturbance where you measure everything, we include all disturbance, fire, everything, at a one meter scale, that the birds were not, were not impacted. So we created the DDCT to analyze what was on the ground before somebody did a project and whether or not it could be allowed. That, uh, that, re that required a lot of monitoring and consistency across the state and it required an adaptive management approach, which we implemented early on in 2008. Next. The results were, we suddenly got started getting multiple wells on a single pad. We had directional drilling. We had road siting. We had companies that were sharing roads where they previously would have built two roads or three. The road design uh, took into account sage grouse habitat needs and wasn't just a 20 foot crown and ditch road every time. We used remote sensing instead of human uh, monitoring. Uh, we did conservation easements to protect against uh, the threat of, of, of ur exurban development. Uh, it guided where our reclamation would go, where restoration was, and it also guided mine plans and then enhancements that we did on the ground. Next. So I just used these because this was the peak of our development period, but we had a massive change in what happened. Vertically drilled single well permits went from 65% uh, reduction. Directional went up by 66. Horizontal went up by 1,337%. Uh, and the total number of wells increased, but the footprint radically decreased. And that was because we had the ability to do that analysis, that density and disturbance analysis. And we had the ability to work with the companies and say, look, if you can move this well uh, a quarter mile, a half mile, if you can do this, if you can get behind a natural barrier, that will, that will minimize your impact. And obviously there was, a, there was a, an incentive there 
that we found in the middle of the process, and that was economic, they actually became more economical. So companies were very, very anxious to work with us. Next. So the strategy is to have a defensible management strategy. Can we go out and say that what we're doing actually is increasing habitat? Are we able to say that the birds are using it? Can we quantify what we're doing? The answer is yes. Do we gave flexibility in core areas, but you had to have the data up front? We gained a better understanding of sage grouse tolerances. What can they tolerate? What can't they? We put well over a million dollars into research in the course of our, of our program. And always, every time we looked at a project, we came back to those three major tenets, void, minimize, and mitigate, and, and had success with that. Next. And finally, as we did that, we went back and, and we checked back with our federal partners. Uh, this was the statement they made that if, if this was implemented, implemented by all landowners, including federal, it would provide adequate protection for sage grouse and their habitat. And that was the end result of what our program did. So I'm gonna stop there, Susan, and hopefully we have time for questions, uh, but that's a quick, dirty overview of where we're at. Thanks very much for that, Bob. That was an excellent presentation, really enjoyed that. Um, I am uh, looking now to see if we have any questions. I'm looking for raised hands or any questions that have been submitted. I'm not seeing any right now. Liz is also helping to monitor this. Liz, do we have any uh, hand, hands raised or questions submitted? Not currently. And just to so remind you folks, point. you can add those at the bottom with your Q&A and with the hand raise icon. Okay, thank you. I I'll might make ahead. one point while we're waiting then. Sure. And that is that I think you have to give a lot of credit to, to all of the different people who participated, and I kind of glossed that over. You know, Game and Fish's initial reaction, I hope Brian's still on, was, hey, this is our domain. We're supposed to do this. And, and that, we worked through that. Fish and Wildlife at the time had some jurisdiction. BLM said this is happening on our lands. And and the way that we got there is that everybody was equal in this process. In other words, we didn't regulate state lands differently than private, differently than federal. It was all universal. So we were blind to land ownership. We recognize the game and fish has the authority over wildlife, but their, their forte wasn't that really policy side. So everybody brought something to the table and everybody gave a little bit up. And that was really critical. And that was probably the first three or four meetings. It was feeling out where, where those lines were. But that's something I thought I ought to add there. Thanks, Bob. It looks like we've got a couple questions that are starting to come in through the question box. I've got two of them. I'll start with the first one here, which is from David Pike. And he's asking, did you have any groups or companies that refused to participate? No, uh, we had better and lesser. Um, we had some uh, what we call golf cart rides where we go off two of us in a cart and have a little conversation. Um, particularly, uh, there was one company that came in that, that was adamant that they weren't going to do it. Uh, but as we walked through what the authorities were and what the risk was, and then frankly, uh, their own peers stepped in, uh, we've had tremendous uh, uh, participation. There, and not that there haven't been some we had to have a little bit of uh, conversation with, but, but it's been good. Great, thank you. And so there's actually another question that came in as well. So we've got two more for you. Um, the next one's from Rick and he is asking, how do you determine when disturbed habitat is rehabbed and additional disturbance can occur? The, uh, we have a fairly strict set of, uh, of guidelines for how that's done. If it's disturbed, it would move from counting as disturbed and mapped as disturbed to what we would call transitional. And that, that's defined by two native grass species, uh, perennials, and two native forbs. Um, and we have a list of which ones that, you know, are the desirables there. Uh, there's a favor, a more favorable view on bunch grasses in areas where they will grow, uh, and the ability for sagebrush to, to come back. 
it wouldn't be counted as uh, as completely re renovated, if you will, until it had all the components, which would include 5% sagebrush, co sagebrush cover, uh, the grasses and forbs soil sta stabilized, and occupation by the birds. So it's a pretty high bar. Um, the transitional will allow it to be considered differently, particularly if the birds are using it. So we'll get areas where you put a, a, a feature in on the landscape. Um, if you use the minimization protocols and keep that as small as possible, you'll find birds will use it to forage and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but if it's too big, obviously, you lose the, the middle out of it, and that would count as disturbed until it's uh, restored to a point where it's usable by the birds. Great. And um, I think we've got time for one more question here. So this is from an anonymous attendee. They're wondering, how did the SGIT um, work with the local working groups? Yeah, the, uh, early on it was a, a very, very tight relationship because we were trying to develop the maps. So we, we would come up with a map for the state and they participate. Obviously we have local working group members on the SIGIT as well. Um, we went back to each of those local working groups and said, fact check us. And so I went to each of those meetings. Some of them we had two or three. We sat down with their local knowledge uh, their local biologists, their local BLM folks, local forest service people, and said, did we get this right? And so they actually altered those boundaries significantly. I remember one we went to and, and uh, the conservation district manager said, this is a bog down here. It doesn't show up very well on the aerial photo, but it's actually duck habitat, not grouse habitat. That came out. And then we had another one right adjacent to it and they said that ridge up there is actually really good nesting habitat that went back in. So the end result of our, of our work with the local working groups was that we actually added over a million acres to core based on their input and their, and their knowledge of those local areas. As we got deeper into it, uh, the local working groups didn't have quite as much a hands-on role, but more recently we just met with all of them a month ago and we're now uh, going to start re-energizing that local and, and state relationship because of uh, what they can do relative to grant money, uh, monitoring, and a bunch of other areas. And, and I think it'll re-energize those groups as well as the SIGIT. Thanks. I think we have time to squeeze in one more last question. And then any other ones that come in, we will um, pass on to you to follow up with offline. Sure. So this next one here is, um, has the process lost its momentum? Um, and if so, how do you keep the momentum going? No, it hasn't. Uh, they, it ebbs and flows a little bit. You know, as you, as you ramp up, for instance, as Governor Gordon did his new executive order, we changed the format for the executive order pretty significantly between uh, what we started with with Governor Friedenthal, what we did as we worked through Governor Meade's eight years, and then uh, with Governor Gordon, we, we went to a very different uh, format. It didn't change the order much. In fact, the order probably got stronger, but it changed the, the readability and the way that it works. So when you got into that, people were very busy. We had a lot of subgroups working, we did all that. Then as you get done with that, uh, your, your need to meet obviously is reduced somewhat. So we went back to meeting, you know, every, every couple of months or, or quarterly. Um, obviously, COVID's changed that. But uh, we haven't lost. There are a lot of things that we can do right now. I think we're more focused on handbooks and manuals of how to do things, how to do a DDCT, that sort of thing. Uh, the other part that, that we're working on is data collection and how to, how to do that better. Uh, and then the other area that we're looking at is restoration and, and reclamation. Uh, so we, you kind of evolve into different uh, roles and different functions, but the group has stayed together and we still have a, over a third, about 40% of the SIGIT has been on since 2007, uh, which is incredibly valuable because we don't stop and go reinvent the wheel. We say, you catch up, but here's your mentor and they'll help you catch up. 
Thanks very much, Bob, for answering those questions and thanks folks for submitting them. Uh, it really helps to make this interactive when we have some questions to respond to. Um, and I think we do have a couple extra ones uh, that Bob, we will be circling back with you on and, and trying to get responses that we can also post. So thank you so much for that presentation. We are going to move on uh, to our next presenter. This is about the Douglas Core Area Restoration Team. And we have Jenna White, uh, who's the senior ecologist with Trihydro Corporation, and Dally Edmonds, uh, the policy and outreach coordinator with the Audubon Rockies. Um, before they begin their presentation, I just want to mention uh, that if you, if you ever think that you're uh, kind of a smarty pants when it comes to technology, you'll be reminded on a daily basis that there's always something that you don't know how to figure out. So today, um, our challenge is that any controls I have are showing up as uh, gray boxes on your screen. Uh, this was not the case yesterday, which is why this is so fun to try to think about today. So I'm trying to keep my controls minimized and out of the way of the slides. I apologize. We hope that we'll be able to get this figured out before this afternoon. Uh, but if you see that happening, it is certainly not the presenters and uh, they did a nice job putting their slides together. So apologies for that. Uh, so with that, I am going to turn it over, uh, Jana and Dali, not certain who is leading here, but um, uh, just say next and I will move the slides for you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I'm going to start first. So I'll introduce myself and Jana White. Um, Jana, you might need to get a little closer to your mic. You're um, kind of coming in and out a bit. Well, I may actually shift to a headset. I think that would be, that would be a great idea. Let me quickly do that. Okay. All right, is that much better? That is much better. And, and yeah, just speak loudly. It's, it's a, a little thinner sound, but I think we're able to hear you much better. And folks, if you need to dial up your volume on your end, um, please do so. Uh, so Jenna, please continue. Um, all right, so for the past almost seven years now, um, I've been working as a facilitator for the Douglas Core Area Restoration Team. Um, as Susan indicated, I and Dolly Edmonds are going to be co-presenting today. And I am gonna turn it over to Dolly to introduce herself and then also kick off our presentation. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dolly Edmonds, and I am the Policy and Outreach Director for Audubon Rockies. We are a regional office of National Audubon Society, serving Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah. Next. And as Jana had indicated, uh, we are going to be doing some tag teaming in this presentation. It is broken up into seven parts. And if you look at your slide on the top left hand corner of your slide, you're going to see numbers and those are going to be tracking those seven points in our outline. We're going to be setting the stage and familiarizing you with Douglas Core Area Restoration Team. What was the impetus for our formation and the outline for our approach? We're gonna be talking about our structure and project design. We'll examine how effective we've been and how we've evolved over time. And I think some of the big points that's gonna be good with today's talk is we're gonna share with you what we perceive as barriers and challenges to our work. And finally, we're gonna wrap up with some key takeaways related to outreach, stakeholders, and partnerships. Next, please. So the purpose of this slide is to really orient everyone to the general area within the sagebrush biome where we've been working on habitat restoration work. And as described in several presentations yesterday, there really is a considerable heterogeneity in plant community structure throughout this biome. The Douglas Core Area, or DCA, is located in northeastern Wyoming. It falls within an area that has been historically considered grass dominated within the sagebrush components. Um, in this landscape, we have perennial species return really quite rapidly after a fire. However, even decades after the fire, the landscape still appears to be remain relatively devoid of sagebrush. Like much of northeastern Wyoming, large areas of the sagebrush steppe habitat were historically treated and have been converted to grassland or crops. There's existing energy development and a history of significant wildfires. Next. 
Now, when we're talking about the Douglas Core area, why here um, and more a little bit more about it. Um, the Douglas Core area has really become a focus for deliberate coordinated management activities. A number of factors led to the development and establishment of the Douglas Core Area Restoration Team. Um, this core area is relatively small. It's located along the eastern boundary of the current distribution of sage grouse, seen here in that, um, that orange circle on your far right. As Bob noted earlier, core areas are part of the conservation strategy, the purpose of which is to eliminate or is to limit development in high quality habitats that are integral to the conservation of sage grouse over time. When the Douglas Core Area Restoration Team was established in 2013, disturbance in the Douglas Core Area was, was really high, greater than 5%. Approximately 10% of this core area has actually been burned by wildfires in the past 25 years, and reestablishment of sagebrush within these areas has remained low. Majority of the land here is held within private land ownership, and there are competing demands on the landscape, including valid and existing rights for oil and gas development. Now, the Douglas Core area has a small number of birds. At present, the density of sage grouse in the DCA continues to be one of the lowest in the state, consisting of only five occupied leks. When looking at lek counts between 2000 and 2018, in that 10 year frame, the peak number of males ranges between seven to a high of 53. So despite these relatively um, low numbers, comparatively low numbers to other places around Wyoming, Wyoming Game and Fish Department does view this population of sage grouse as potentially genetically significant because of its geographical location relative to other populations in the state. Next. So in 2013, um, Chesapeake Operating, in conjunction with its part pipeline partner at the time, Williams, developed the plan uh, for development in coordination with the state of Wyoming as well as the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And you can see a copy of, of the plan here. It was initially developed in 2013, like I said, um, and it extended for a five-year period. Um, that plan was, in, was renewed in 2018, and so it will continue for five additional years. Um, Bob talked quite a bit about the mitigation or hierarchy in his presentation and this the mitigation hierarchy was really critical in the development of this plan um, where possible uh, Chesapeake operating in it strategically cited wells to avoid and minimize impacts um, and you know this this approach balanced conservation um, with development um, and where not possible uh, mitigation was applied um, next slide please so the, the Douglas Core Area, or DCA, as you'll hear Dolly and I talk about it throughout this presentation, um, was developed following an extensive review of habitat quality data that resulted in dividing the core area into three different management units. Um, and you can see these here with the blue, gray, and tan coloring on the right. Um, as shown, the, the blue areas um, are predominantly high quality habitat. You can see the, the location of LEX in, with those green boxes. Uh, gray was predominantly suitable habitat uh, or connectivity corridors. And then the tan was predominantly disturbed or low quality unsuitable habitat. Also shown here um, for the Douglas Core area are the locations of disturbed areas um, and wildfire areas as well. Um, the pink is showing you areas that were disturbed and the pink surrounded by those blue lines shows you a, a number of locations where there were significant wildfires over time, the large of which took place in the northern part of the Douglas Core area. Next slide, please. Um, as Dolly indicated, and as you can see here, the Douglas Core is about 67,000 acres, and the vast majority of this is private land. So the white colors in this, this outline of the Douglas Core area is showing you private land ownership. Um, there are some state land parcels um, that cover about 7% and some federal lands as well. But it became very apparent to the team up front that you know this was a private land um, or an opportunity for partnerships with private landowners. Next slide, please. Funding for the Douglas Core Area Restoration Team was, uh, the initial pool of funding was set aside as mitigation and earmarked for restoration projects. Um, throughout the course of time, 
um, the industry partners that are integral to this group have also provided financial support. And the other, um, the team has also been really active in leveraging some of the initial funds that were established to Purdue, Purdue pursue additional funding. Um, uh, these are funds that, you know, both small and large that have been used for things such as cheatgrass management and, and spraying in collaboration with local weed and pest, as well as some research funding as well. And one of the key pieces that's been actually really integral to this uh, pursuance of additional funding is the multi-stakeholder members of the Douglas Core Area Restoration Team. Since the team itself is not really an entity, um, it's a loose group of individuals who have come together, um, participating members have been integral as helping to, you know, be the project proponent for a variety of grants. Next slide, please. So when we talk about who is the DCA restoration team, again, we were established in 2013. We are a multi-stakeholder team comprised of partners working to advance our collective knowledge of sage grouse habitat conservation. Um, on, in front of you is a list of who all these active members are. They come from local, state, and federal agencies, non-governmental organizations, oil and gas industry and academia, over 20 members, which is really quite impressive. The latter of which the academia um, has really provided valuable research expertise and university connections. Together, we are supported by two contracting entities, TriHydro, for which Jana works for, and Western Ecosystems Technology. Next, please. Um, the DCA's restoration team on the groundwork is really focused on reducing the footprint of existing disturbances within the Douglas core area. Because again, our goal is to enhance the overall habitat for sage grouse and sagebrush obligate species. Our work is focused um, in three areas. The top two, which are circled, are we're going to describe in a bit more detail in this presentation, but ultimately we're going to report out on all three. We developed projects to enhance seasonal habitat to support survival and reproduction of sage grouse. Secondly, we strove to restore disturbed habitat to suitable or functional grouse habitat. And we implemented projects that target local threats to sage grouse in northeastern Wyoming. Next, please. We are also looking at the um, operational structure here and the DCA restoration team has been led by contractors who facilitate meetings. They oversee project development, implementation logistics, they coordinate with landowners and really provide overall operational capacity. The importance of this role can't be emphasized in the Douglas Core Area Restoration Team's work. Additionally, there has been consistent support from the state of Wyoming. Our team meets about 10 to 12 times per year, which really facilitates transparency, relationship, and trust building, as well as the timely ability to discuss and adjust approaches. Um, we have a diverse expertise um, on the team, which really allows meaningful engagement on a variety of subgroups. These subgroups range everywhere from outreach development, project development, cheatgrass management. Uh, and our, our members of our team are organized and participate in, in various project site visits. We also took part to varied degrees in field work, um, which has occurred not only for planning purposes, but also for plantings and subsequent monitorings. Next. Another critical element um, in our operational structure is the partnerships that the team has established with private landowners. Um, project development has really been a one-on-one -on -one collaborative approach that has been based on the explicit recognition of the diversity of ecosystem services that these lands provide. And so you can see in this one photo here at the base of the slide, um, you can see cattle in the background and a fenced exclosure. Um, these are working lands and a very integral part of our working relationship with private landowners was developing a plan that met the objectives um, of their land operation. And a really key aspect of this process over time was that building of trust. Um, our team established from a very early phase landowner liaisons and these two folks in particular um, who had, you know, significant relationships with landowners in the Douglas Core area over time um, allowed the team to, you know, navigate um, development of particular projects. And they've remained active members of our team through time, which has really helped to 
um, ensure consistency and continuity. We'll be developing a few projects for next fall that um, will be, again, in, in uh, combination with some of the landowners we've worked with in the past. Um, and I think this piece uh, is really critical because ultimately the team was in a process of, you know, building a reputation where they were having positive relationships with landowners. The, during the first project, um, this was really key and has really allowed for expanding that to working in other areas within the core. Next slide, please. Um, I'll talk just briefly about project design because it was grounded in the tremendous amount of technical expertise that comes with a multi-stakeholder team. Um, the team's approach to establishing um, sagebrush or re-establishing sagebrush within areas that were burned via wildfire was establishing seed source islands. Um, two of the reasons for this, sagebrush seed in, um, typically does not disperse very far. It's one to five meters maybe at most. Um, and seed doesn't remain very viable over time. And so you can imagine, and I have a cartoon here to illustrate this, um, if you have a wildfire or a burn perimeter here, it may take a very long time um, due to the way in which sagebrush seed, uh, sagebrush plants produce seed and then ultimately recruit. And so the team's approach was to establish these seed source islands. You can see them here, kind of shown with the blue under, under bars, um, to effectively break up this perennial grass landscape and introduce seed sources within it. Um, Plant or these processes were about a year in the making um, and began with collection of local seed um, and, and greenhouse growing of seedlings that ultimately resulted in outplantings within project areas. Next slide, please. So as we start to wrap up this presentation, we'll touch on briefly, um, you know, assessing the effectiveness of the team by looking at those three focal areas that Dolly um, introduced at the beginning of the presentation. So the first was developing projects to enhance seasonal habitat to support survival and reproduction of sage grouse. Um, and from 2014 to 2018, we established six projects on the landscape and outplanted about 100,000 sagebrush seedlings. These projects were in three discrete project areas that uh, cumulatively are about a thousand acres. And those are the ones that are here shown um, in the bottom part or maybe on the side of the Douglas core area here outlined in red. Um, those are notably within that higher quality habitat type um, and in close proximity to existing sage grouse lecks. Three additional projects occurred in the North Burn area, which is this area that's a little over 5,000 acres in the northern part of the Douglas Core area. You can see three project areas that are highlighted with, with red as well. And these were done um, and were complementary to some uh, reestablishment efforts that were conducted by Wyoming Game and Fish Department. For fall 2020, we have about 50,000 seedlings that are currently growing in the greenhouse to be also planted into these existing project areas in collaboration with some of the private landowners in the Douglas Core area. Next slide. As far as the two other goals, um, these are also things that the team has worked on during the last almost seven years. Um, we have actually will be hitting the five year milestone for several of our projects this fall. And we continue to collect data annually to uh, kind of chart the progress of the sagebrush seedlings and increases in cover over time. And so ultimately, um, Bob outlined that reclassification process within the, the previous presentation, but the goal is to actually reclassify some of these areas from disturbed to um, transitional habitat over time. They are used by sage grouse, so they function as functional habitat. Um, and we've also documented the um, successful recruitment of some of the seedlings in these areas. We also, um, through two other efforts, targeted local threats to sage grouse in northeastern Wyoming. Um, we in, uh, implemented a West Nile virus program, as well as using some of the NRCS RCPP funds, um, did some spraying for cheatgrass in collaboration with private landowners. Next slide. And let me just mention uh, just a couple, two or three more minutes, if, if you think uh, you can wrap up the presentation, then that would be great. And we'll have a little time for questions. Thank you. 
All right, so we'll quickly wrap up here. Adaptive management has been really critical um, to our process, simply because even though we had a team of technical experts, I think the, the science of sagebrush restoration is evolving through time. Um, our projects have been grounded in frequent data collection and reviewing those data so that we can take that information and make meaningful uh, changes through time in the subsequent implementation of projects. And they've considered things such as biology as well as cost elements. Next slide. So we have been, how have we evolved over time? We've been together for more than six years, and this is impressive not only in recognizing the breadth of participants, but also the consistency in commitment by all the parties. Um, we, we have talked about funding sources and the variety has been growing over time. Um, and we've also increased our outreach and external communications, which has helped in networking efforts. We've done field tours, fact sheets, social media campaigns via Sage West and presented it at um, professional conferences. Next. Um, when we talk about barriers and challenges, um, again, one of the greatest that we've confronted is the temporal mismatch of slow moving recovering ecosystems with really quickly moving pressures on the local and landscape scales. Um, we've heard speakers talk about this, um, but again, it's, it's how do we reestablish sagebrush to where it's considered suitable um, when it can oftentimes take decades to accomplish. Um, recruitment of seedlings continues to be uncertain in both time and space, but it is critical. Another challenge is interest and engagement of private landowners whose economic livelihood is dependent on livestock grazing and how can we make sure that their needs are being continued to be met. Um, finally, as is the case with most collaborative efforts, uh, project funding is dwindling even though need remains. Next. Wrap here, just wrap up here with a couple takeaway slides. Um, this approach to habitat enhancement and restoration for sage grouse and sagebrush obligate species has only really been possible through the sustained commitment of this multi stakeholder group, um, the partnerships with private landowners, and then also the team's emphasis and desire for outreach. And Dolly outlined a number of the ways in which that has uh, come about. Um, the other pieces to just uh, uh, also recognize here our consistent state support from the state of Wyoming, um, Wyoming Game and Fish Department. We've had members of Wyoming Game and Fish Department on our team since its inception. Many of these have remained the same and that element has been so critical to the success of the team. Um, we've also, you know, with our team of uh, subject matter experts, it's been a very much science driven approach and the team has really remained engaged over time through a number of um, through a number of processes. Next slide. And I think I'll wrap up. Um, ultimately, um, yeah, I'll just wrap up and take questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Again, we do have, uh, it looks like a number of questions. So let's, um, let's go ahead and take those. And just to let people know, uh, we promised a, a five minute pause here where you can step away from your screen. Let's go ahead and take um, a couple of questions here and then we will take that brief break. Um, so Liz, uh, why don't you go ahead with the questions? Okay, first question here is, um, did you consider planting sagebrush directly from seed versus seedlings? And how are seedlings protected from wildlife overuse, especially mule deer, uh, legomorphs, et cetera? Should I take that one, Dolly? <laughs> okay. Um, so as Dolly indicated, one of the key pieces of this has been um, uh, researchers from the University of Wyoming being integral to the team's efforts. And there was a re University of Wyoming graduate student who investigated seed recruitment through some studies. Um, and some of what his work demonstrated is some of the real challenges is in reestablishing intact grasslands from seed. A key point to the areas, most of the areas that the team has worked in are many years post fire, not immediately post fire. And so there's a really dense get grass canopy as you can see here. And so dispersing seed into that is not terribly successful. And so that has been um, a primary motivation for using seedlings as opposed to disturbing seed. Um, and then in response to the question about herbivory, we've actually done some herbivory monitoring. One of the slides showed some tagging that we use to actually measure and monitor herbivory over time. And it is significant 
um, for a lot of our initial projects, you can see the project disclosures here that uh, prevented herbivory in the first number of years, but when those are taken down, they can be really substantial. Um, and so what we're observing in a number of sites is pretty static growth of seedlings, just accounting for that consistent herbivory, particularly during winter months. Great, thanks. We'll jump to the next question here, which is what spray or chemicals are used to treat cheat, cheat grass? In these particular areas, um, we used plateau. Um, okay, great. And then anything else you wanted to add on that or is that good? I think that's, okay. if there's additional questions, I can respond. Then the last question we have here is just um, if you could tell us a little bit more about your West Nile program. That's a good question. Um, and I'm probably not the best person to be answering it because that wasn't a piece that I oversaw. But our West Nile virus program involved um, annual surveys um, and then annual surveys, I think, for uh, the particular mosquito and then treatment. And like I indicated, I did not oversee that, but I can certainly connect you with somebody who has. All right, um, I think for time, we will go ahead uh, and stop with those three, but we it sounds like we do have, or looks like we do have one more um, and we will get those to you, uh, Dolly and Jana, uh, for you to respond to. And again, uh, we'll post those on our online site as well. So really appreciate, uh, excellent presentation. Again, appreciate the questions, um, helps for the interactivity here. And so with that, uh, let's go ahead and take a five minute pause. Um, we'll keep projecting, but uh, just give everybody a chance to step away. And if you can just leave your sound on so that you'll be able to hear us when we're coming back, uh, but we'll be pretty close to five minutes. So thank you and we'll see you in a few minutes. This is a presentation on the Ranchers Stewardship Alliance out of Montana, and we have Leo uh, Barthomas uh, presenting today. And, and welcome, Leo, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. Welcome, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak for the group here. Uh, I'm a cow calf rancher. My family ranches in Phillips County, 200 miles west of Williston, North Dakota. 80 miles south of the Canadian border, 30 miles north of the Missouri River. Uh, I'm the current RSA president, Rancher Stewardship Alliance president, and the organization has loosely been in existence for 19 years. Next video, please. Uh, this is our mission statement. Uh, we drew this up or developed this about seven years ago. Ranching conservation communities, a winning team. Uh, we we try to recognize the values in the county, and we're not trying not to be a species advocacy group, livestock versus wildlife. We try to work as a group, as a wide range community, to uh, you know recognize a lot of the values that are in Phillips County. Next video, please. Uh, the Rancher Stewardship Alliance was established in 2003 formally as a nonprofit by 30 ranch families in Montana who saw a need to come together to resolve problems we were facing. A little history about the region where our culture is a little different than a lot of geographic areas in Montana. The, the culture was north of the Missouri River and we were kind of isolated from markets and historic ranch country and then the bison were here the cultures that associated with the bison were here and then the big changes came in the homestead era where the phillips county the highline culture developed with homesteaders coming off the railroad tracks and and migrating across the, this region so we're not as cattle centric as a lot of this there's a lot more farming influence uh, this probably led to the largest massive disturbance of soils and habitats in this region was the homestead era next please so because of the 
a little bit of a unique culture. We're bounded by the Missouri River, which became the Fort Peck Dam, which isolated the community, the area further from the rest of the state of Montana. A lot more diverse opinions because of the farming influence in the homestead era. And we've always been subject to quite a bit of interest from outlying areas. Uh, there's some irrigation projects that were created some conflict in the region. And then in the 80s, that prairie dog became a species of concern and a subsequent value for the ferret reintroduction that created a lot more anxiety among the community. Those things kind of went away for a while. And then we have another problem developed, which turned out to be not a problem, but uh, we had a big conservation group by a large ranch in the area. Next, please. The Nature Conservancy became our new neighbors. We were unaware of um, what they wanted here because we were largely a ranching communities, especially in South Phillips County. And we had no relationship with them. The communities had no relationship with the uh, Nature Conservancy. So everybody was a little skeptical about the reasons that they wanted to be here. and we just didn't know what to expect. Next, please. Well, we found out why they were here. Grasslands, the same, they valued, the Nature Conservancy valued the same things that we did. Grasslands, wildlife, productive forages, habitat. Uh, it turns out that the reason, one of the driving forces for purchasing this ranch was to protect it from plow out. Uh, the next highest, most next interested party in the ranch was, was typically going to farm it. So it, it's, uh, the ranching community did not understand the conservation values that were in this area. Next, please. So this is an exploded view of the region. You have Valley County highlighted on the right, Phillips County in the middle, Blaine County on the left, and the species of that are of concern in this region. Uh, in sage grouse, of course, this is one of the biggest core areas for the sage chickens, the region, this region here. Also huge amounts of wetland production. Phillips County produces, is one of the highest producing wetland duck production areas in the United States. And it also turns out, unaware of the ranching community again, that we also have the second longest wildlife migration goes right through Phillips and Valley County. The antelope come from northern Saskatchewan and drift south of, to, of the Missouri River, Fort Peck Lake area, maybe as far as Miles City, Jordan, those kinds of areas. So this, this is basically the hotspot of conservation in, in the continental United States. Next, please. As you can see by this expanded map, Montana Glaciated Plains, a red square is what we just looked at. And the concentration of those little icons is the Phillips County area. The area north of the Missouri River Fort Peck Lake is the primary focus area for the Rancher Stewardship Alliance. We have, have projects ongoing in this area. Next, please. So what do we do now? We have new neighbors. We're unfamiliar with our new neighbors. What are we going to do? Well, it turns out that a drought facilitated the ranchers working with the Nature Conservancy and what has become the Matador Grass Bank. And fortunately, the ranch manager for the Nature Conservancy Matador Ranch recognized the need to have facilitated community meetings. So she was able to secure funding from the Nature Conservancy and we had numerous meetings to develop the relationships so that we could uh, figure out ways to everybody benefit from working together. 
we didn't trust the nature conservancy they were a little skeptical about the ranchers it's just that you know, things you have to go through before you can make some real progress um so next please so following our community meetings we were able to secure a grant and allowed us to tour around and look at other non-community nonprofits. The Blackfoot Challenge has been a mentor for us. We went to the Malpai Borderlands Group and looked at the programs that they had in place. Members of the ranching community from RSA country went to the Nebraska Sand Hills Task Force and the Val Madison Valley Ranchlands Group. These were successful programs that we wanted to duplicate so that the ranching community could participate in the change that was that had come to our our area our county. We recognized that we can't stop change, but we wanted to be participate in guiding that change so everybody could benefit next please. So this is the early group that started the Rancher Stewardship Alliance formally. Their board of directors on in here and president in here. Uh, we became an officially became a 501 C3 in 2003. Uh, we were aided in that endeavor by the legal counsel from the Nature Conservancy of Montana and the National Association. Uh, the Rancher Stewardship Alliance went all went to the effort of becoming a land trust. Although we have not implemented any of that, we have not had the capacity to participate in those kinds of endeavors. That's a really big lift for a small community operation. Uh, we support support sustainable conservation that features private and public cooperation in a working landscape stewarded by profitable family ranches and thriving rural communities. Early on, in order to, main, to work with the, the conservation community as well as maintain our uh, standing within the ranching community because some people did not, would not trust the conservation community we not only we hosted rangeland tours we have implemented and and hosted educational opportunities that include ranching for profit stockmanship schools grazing schools uh, succession planning workshop we want to lift our entire community to successful economic value so we we have maintained this for 19 years so next please again to emphasize the goals of rsa we engage in collaborative conservation and community building encourage ranching and other traditional livelihoods that will sustain will sustain our native grasslands and rural communities uh, collect implement and disseminate accurate information on the ecology and the sustainable management of the working grasslands and we advocate for ranching and the value that we play in wildlife habitat and the economies of the world phillips county is the 29th largest cow producer in the united states and valley county is the 31st so within this region we provide a lot of feeder cattle for the livestock industry Next, please. So recently, as of 2017, some of our supporters that come to our meetings, which we're very blessed to have a diverse group of RSA supporters. We have young women, young men, old men, old women. Uh, you know, we have a really diverse group of people. Some of us are ranchers, some of us aren't, some of us are from the conservation committee, or conservation community, I'm sorry. Uh, we work, we have a really diverse group of people that we get to flesh out a lot of positive ideas and people feel free to bring programs to us and opportunities to us because we've 
considered ourselves from early on as a clearinghouse for information as well as a neutral place to have meetings to resolve any conflicts or explore new ideas that are maybe a little bit unconventional or a bit out of the box, but we wanted to be that place people could bring those kinds of ideas. So following a successful grant application from NIFWIF that was brought to us by uh, a young person that supports us, we formed, we were successful in the grant application and we had money, we were awarded money to water, fence and water CRP. We were awarded and part of that was part of the venue. And then we were also, uh, the money was dedicated to seeding farmland back to grass and to do some crested wheatgrass mitigation if if so those projects so in order to use that money wisely to give give our investment opportunity to to really do a good job we formed the conservation committee and there's a large group of uh of committee members and we came together and brought this group of people together and pooled our resources to not only help us use our money wisely but to give other people opportunity to use their money wisely as well next slide please so this is the this is our conservation committee and this slide's a bit dated we have some additional participants now um, but it, this this allows the rancher stewardship alliance and the conservation committee that these pr projects that people want to implement on their properties are sec secured by some of the partners they they're out in the field working with landowners and they bring the projects back to the conserva rsa conservation committee and then those projects are vetted and ranked by the entire group and the and the committee gives a recommendation to fund a project and then that goes to the board of directors for the rancher stewardship alliance to actually uh, finance the project um, we pool multiple sources of money uh, some some uh, sometimes a rancher stewardship alliance builds fences sometimes uh, fish wildlife and parks builds fences uh, the u.s fish wildlife service is integral in in building fences wetlands and reservoir development is done by ducks unlimited the nature conservancy offers technical expertise all of these groups work together to get the biggest bang for the buck for the resources to help our community as of the date we have improved grassland grazing opportunities on 20,000 acres uh, our in-kind and cash that we have brought to Valley Phillips and Blaine counties for conservation work is totaling over two million dollars and we have continued to be successful in in getting these projects on the ground and we have a backlog of projects like other presenters have stated today there's more demand than there is money so you know there's always projects for us to participate in and and grow uh, we have done additional projects and uh, we'll continue to work at one of the big problems that we've had is we were an all-volunteer group until 2018 and we had funding for an executive director and the last grant helped us fund a uh a, two additional employees we have so that we have really been blessed with with getting an accountant to do grant and financials for us and we have a communications expert to help us build relationships and help us sustain our media presence and you know we want to reach out and, and empower other communities like the aces group in south of the missouri river in montana or other 
local rancher led conservation groups we want to we want to help them work through the pitfalls that we faced the last 19 years uh, our partners have been been instrumental in not only helping us get the conservation dollars to the ground to help the ranching community but there's also a number of young people career people on the conservation committee that have also helped us work through the bureaucracy of a nonprofit, developing policy manuals and developing employee manuals and you know the appropriate interviews for employees and it, it, it's a big lift for a small volunteer group and thankfully we have a large group of supporters in the community that participate every month at meetings um, so we're, we're truly blessed with the opportunities of the people and the diversity of people we get to work with. Um, next slide, please. So I guess this is, this is what we, this, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And we've been working at this for 19 years. Uh, and we really appreciate the support that we have received from many different people and we hope to continue on into the future and providing support for other small nonprofit community-based organizations. I realize I rushed through this, but. Are, are we ready for uh, questions, Leo? Yes, I'm ready for questions. I'd rather answer questions than make presentations. Okay, well, that was a great presentation. Um, so we will see if we have a couple questions. Before we get to those, though, I do want to just make a quick, uh, I guess it's a combination request and, and announcement. Because we wanted to get as much interaction as possible, um, we're feeling like maybe we can uh, get to one more presentation in this morning session uh, before we go to the afternoon session. So would like to ask Charlie and Jason if they would be amenable to having the Idaho Cheatgrass Challenge presentation uh, lead off the afternoon session at 2 p.m. Mountain. So if you could contemplate that, uh, Charlie and Jason, and, and if that doesn't work for you, uh, let us know, uh, maybe reach out to Liz and we'll see what other jostling around we can do here. But we would like to make sure there's plenty of time and we have a little more time this afternoon. So just it's, something to think about. Susan, that's no problem. We can wait. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Charlie. Yep. All right. So questions for Leo. Do we have any? Liz, I'm going to hand this over to you to manage the questions. We have no questions at this point. Oh, right. When I said that, we got a hand raised here from Brett um, Brownstone. So Brett, I'm going to unmute you and allow you to talk. Brett, can you hear us? I'm trying to unmute you, but um, you may need to accept on your end. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thanks, Liz. And yeah, so my question was, um, in that part of Montana with a farming community and a ranching community, was there ever much of a wedge between the farming and the ranching community around um, the interest of what, of what you all were doing? Because it seemed like the common ground that brought eventually the Nature Conservancy and the ranching community together was around um, grassland health, not necessarily um, creating more tilled crops. And I don't know if that created tension with the farming community, but I'm just curious. Uh, to expound on that a little bit, Phillips County is about a hundred miles long when the Milk River divides it basically in half at midpoint, north and south. And north of the Milk River is a lot more intensely farmed. The soils are a lot better. The temperatures are a lot cooler. South of the M Milk River, between the Milk River and the Fort Peck Reservoir, the soils are largely clay and they're difficult to farm. And so there's islands of farming in South Phillips County, but uh, mostly it's grassland and after the homestead era just did so much disturbance, it was seeded back to grass. And so we have this diverse grassland mixture of 
reclaimed or uh, replanted grass, which was uh, sage crested wheatgrass and uh, sagebrush. And so the, fit, the Nature Conservancy bought the Matador Ranch, which is largely grassland and RSA's focus is nearly all in South Phillips County because that is where all the conservation, the sage chickens and the antelope migration is basically through. So there's not been a farming grassland conflict with the Nature Conservancy or the Rancher Stewardship Alliance. Okay, thanks Leo. Yeah, it's a really impressive collaborative and it sounds like um, that kind of geographic prioritization of where to go and where not to go was important juice to making it happen. Yeah, like I, I don't know that I made it clear, but the ranching community was for the most part very unaware of the conservation values this region had. And once we understood the value of that, it was a lot easier to participate and we could get a lot more support from the community. Thank you so much, Leo, for, again, for your presentation and for responding to, um, to the question there. Really appreciate that. Uh, we are going to go ahead and, and wrap this up and move to our next presentation. Um, but again, thanks so much, Leo. Uh, really, really good information to have. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are now moving to our next presentation uh, regarding rangeland fire protection associations. And we have Martin Vetter who will be presenting on this. Um, and Martin, we're gonna to try to give you the maximum amount of time here, uh, but if you could uh, allow for a couple of minutes before the top of the hour so that we could take some questions, that would be great. And we'll um, probably minimize some of the wrap up that we do or that we have done for morning sessions and just go ahead and adjourn and then we'll move into the afternoon later. So turning it over to you, Martin. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, so what is a Rangeland Fire Protection Association? Who are they? So next slide, please. Next slide. There we go. So the, the rangelands or the RFPAs, which I'll probably refer to them as, they're, they're basically a nonprofit. They're a 501c3 made up basically of ranchers, farmers, small business owners, rural landowners, retirees, uh, lawyers, accountants, basically all walks of life. But uh, most of all, they are all, all volunteers. Next. Next slide, there we go, oh, there we go. So in, uh, in Oregon, the, the, the RFPAs are allowed to form through the Board of Forestry. And so they, uh, the landowners put forth the letter to the Board of Forestry to hold a, a public hearing. And then they are, uh, once that's approved by the board, then they uh, sign an agreement with the state forester. And that, that agreement allows them uh, certain avenues. Um, for property, which is the FFP or Federal Fire Program, or the FEPP, which is the Federal Access Personal, Pro Personal Property Program. And this, this allows them to uh, get vehicles, but it also <clears throat> allows them to get grants. And so a lot of these RPAs uh, are kind of funded, a, a lot of it on, on grant money as well. So you can see that uh, the State Forester, once they're approved, they've signed an agreement with the State Forester. And next slide, please. Next slide, there we go. So after the RPA signed the MOU and operating plans, we're also with the Department of Interior. So the BLM and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And this allows each, all three of the agencies to conduct fire suppression on each other's land. And uh, which has been a huge, huge plus. Uh, since most of the ground is actually uh, BLM or US Fish and Wildlife Service. Some of them have actually taken the next step and signed into a cooperative fire agreement with the Department of Interior. And uh, these things have been going on for a while. Many RPAs now have uh, 
MOUs or memorandums, memorandum of understandings with some of the rural fire districts that might be in the area as well. Next. Next, here we go. So currently, there are 24 RFPAs in the state of Oregon, kind of highlighted in yellow there, with the oldest one being Ironside, which was founded in 1964. And the newest one that's uh, up in Wasco County, which was formed in uh, 2019. The main thing with these is, currently there are over a thousand volunteers in the RPA system. And over 700 of these folks have been trained. And some of these folks have uh, come and gone and moved into different areas or different states, but the training has been an ongoing ongoing piece to this this whole program is uh, in conjunction with the, the BLM and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Next. Just so you know, Marvin, I think you're getting a little delay on the slides. We are switching them, but they seem to take a few minutes to pop up on your end. Yeah, I am have a poor connection, I think. So for, for the state of Oregon, the, the RPA program basically consists of two people for the state. Uh, myself as the rangeland fire protection coordinator, and I kind of take care of a lot of the training, uh, property allocation, coordination, and communications. And then we have a rangeland administrative specialist that takes care of reimbursements, grants, and community wildfire protection plans. And uh, so we're kind of unique in Oregon that we do uh, reimburse the RFPAs for their liability insurance which helps them operate and, and continue to grow. And with that, in 20, I think it was 2016, 17, the Department of the Interior also has a statewide coordinator that, uh, that works with me. And they also have a RFPA liaison in Harney County, which was founded by the Harney County Wildfire Collaborative, which you'll hear from later today. Next. So part of that agreement with the state forester, we talked about the FFP and FEPP stuff, is uh, we help assist them in acquiring some used military equipment. And they turn this firefighter equipment into fire trucks. Next. All right. As you can see here, they've, they've taken the Humvees and uh, confirmed them into fire trucks. What's really nice is these, these off-road vehicles can go in a lot of different areas and some very treacherous ground uh, to get in some real tough places to, to take care of fire. These are our smaller, we call type six engines, carrying roughly about 200, uh, 150 to 200 gallons of water. And these are from four different associations. The upper left would be Silver Creek out of Riley uh, or in Harney County. The one on the right is uh, out of Jefferson County. I think we might have we might have lost Marvin. <laughs> uh, Marvin, we are not able to hear your audio. Can you try again? You're not. Oh, now we can. You just you popped out for a minute. Okay. Okay. So so these uh these are the finished products of some of the vehicles. The one on the upper left is Silver Creek out of Harney County. The the one on the right. The type six or 200 gallon engine is out of Jefferson County, lower left is in Wheeler County, and the lower right is French Glen out of Harding County as well. Next. So those are the light engines. These are some of the heavier equipment they get and they convert into fire trucks. And um, you see dozers, big transports and stuff, and, and six-wheel drive and four-by-fours. Next.
So it, kind of a picture of some of the finished products from what you saw just before, but you know, putting these trucks together can be a substantial amount of money for them. And so we usually get the vehicles for the cost of transporting here from the military bases. And then the, uh, the RFPAs will either apply for what we call VFA or volunteer fire assistance grants up to about $10,000 a year and their own dues to uh, complete the, uh, the fire apparatus you see here. Next. So in 2019, um, some of the equipment listed in the desert is they have actually up to now 345 engines, 101 ATVs, UTVs with water tanks, 55 water tenders, 87 dozers, 24 road graders, 48 transports with tractors, 13 tractors with this. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of, of some of the equipment that they have listed out in the desert that they've converted uh, military or, or federal trucks into fire engines. Next. So training has really been a focus uh, for ODF and BLM. And um, when I first started in 2014, we had less than, um, we had about 400 volunteers and less than 100 been trained. And then 20, the fall of 2015, we instigated a, uh, a firefighting class. It took about a day and a half, two days, and kind of give the ranchers and the volunteers a, an idea of what to expect out there. And another issue we had was uh, radio communications. There wasn't very many radios, and there's not a lot of cell service out in the Oregon desert. So we uh, really looked at <clears throat> enhancing the, the use and the training and of the, the radios, either handheld and mobiles, for the communication piece that it takes for fighting fire. Next. So you can see some stats there. The, and so back in 2014, when I first came over here, we had uh, at least one fire that I knew of the buzzard complex that was a half a million acres. Um, in 2015, we had multiple fires and we tallied over 300,000 acres burned in the desert. And then 2015 is part of the uh, Sage Grouse Initiative for Oregon the Oregon legislature uh, granted the RFPAs a, a $1.2 million grant to spend on whatever they need to make things right. And so um, I kind of redid some of their annual reports starting in the 2016 season. So that's really only the good data that I have. Prior to that, it's kind of historic, but uh, you can see it in 20, 2016, we had 116 fires that burned 87,000 acres. And uh, and the number of fires that exceeded uh, 500 acres was seven. One thing to, re to realize out of that is four of those fires, four of them out of the 116 made it to 82,000 acres. So their success rate was, was very, very high. 2017, you see an increase in uh, number of fires. It was a very dry year, um, 103,000 ac acres burned. But one, one of those fires was uh, 52,000 acres, the Center Butte fire. And uh, that was contained in less than 24 hours. And, and the, between the, the BLM, the Forest Service, and four RFPAs that worked on that, they caught that fire fairly quickly, like I said, in less than 24 hours. In 2018, you saw the number of fires go up again. And part of that is uh, better reporting by the RFPAs. But um, we also, that was another year where we uh, had several, several fires and not too many large fires. It says 17 of them that are over 500 acres, but there was only three of them that actually went, uh, or one of them, actually one fire in 2018 that got over into the five digits. And that was Jenny's Peak that went to 50,000 acres. And then in 2019, um, which was a really good year for us, 
where we only burnt, uh, actually the number of fires over 500 there should be five. And uh, where we only burned a total of 34,000 34, acres and only one fire that was in the five digits, which was the poker fire that burnt 23,400 out of that 37,000, 34,000 acres that uh, that was also caught in less than 24 hours. So their, their success rate after that initial grant from the legislature uh, dramatically improved. And part of that improvement too was the training that was started in the fall of 2015 and then the use of of radios as well. Next. Uh, Marvin, just hopping in here while this slide is transitioning. So it looks like you have about eight slides left and we just have uh, about three minutes to the top of the hour. I know the slow slide okay. changes are affecting you. Um, so just thinking and asking if participants could maybe just hang on for an extra five minutes or so to enable you to wrap up and then also um, to allow us a question or two. Thank you. You bet. So one of the benefits of RPA is that rapid initial attack. And so they, they actually uh, spread their resources out across to the different ranches so they can actually, when the fire is called in, they can get there at a little bit uh, quicker response than, than typically where, where engines are housed at a fire station that may be an hour or two hours away. Next. So they looked at uh, protecting habitat, grazing, and even personal property. Uh, they help protect it. They do not fight structure fires, but they'll try to stop it before it meets, gets to a structure. Next. So they have also branched out other than just doing fire prevention uh, or fire suppression. They're also working with fire prevention and they actually worked with emerging managers on the, the solar eclipse that came through Oregon several years ago as well. Next. So they also work with uh, prescribed fire. Uh, the slide on the left is a NRCS project out of Wheeler County and uh, work with the Jefferson County Soil and Water Conservation District uh, for a graph for reseeding after they take care of conifer production. That's Jefferson County on the right. Next. So some of the partners are kind of isolated out in the desert, but they have learned to grow and, and, and find more partners in different ones. So working with current county emergency managers, county sheriffs, NRCS, city rural fire department, soil water conservation, Harney County Collaborative, OSU Extension, state and federal legislature. Well, the list is continuing to grow as we go year after year with the number of partners they have. Next. So in the last five years, one of the things we've really been working on is, is communication, understanding, and working together. And as you can see, the slide on the right, you've got some uh, firefighters there. It's actually out of there. There's two, two federal firefighters in there amongst all those ranchers, if you can pick them out. And you can see in the bottom left where we have RFPA tenders filling up heavy, large BLM tender uh, engines on, on a large fire as well. Next. So how do we measure its success? We take care of those fires that, that nobody hears about. And there, there seems to be more and more of those. As long as we don't make the news, we know we're, we're doing our job. Next. So we are, uh, that's our motto is neighbors helping neighbors and everybody's our neighbors. And I say we on some of these larger fires, you may see three, four, or even five RFPAs coming together to work together as one with their, with their federal partners. Thank you. Thank you Try very much, Marvin. That. Yeah, excellent um, presentation. I am going to hop over to see if we have some questions. I can see 
uh, it looks like we at least have one um, written. I'm going to turn it over to Liz to read the questions and respond. Yes, so here's a question from Jennifer Forby, and it is, how do you deal with liability issues of volunteers in terms of injury or damage to themselves or property? So they, the, the RPAs do, uh, as a 501c3, they do have liability insurance that covers the board for any issues and in vehicles um, for any incidents that may be happening. As far as personal stuff, it being volunteers, they, uh, they don't fall under workman's comp or anything. So most of them, it's a uh, personal one is gonna be on the ranch insurance. Great, thank you. That seems to be the only question we have at the moment, Susan. Okay. Um, let me just, uh, while we see if we have any other questions, uh, let me just mention for those who uh, are going to be joining us in the afternoon um, that, and again, if you do have a question for Marvin, uh, please submit it. I'm just going to make a couple remarks while we're waiting. Uh, we have an afternoon session that begins at 2 p.m. Mountain. Um, we will start with the Idaho Cheatgrass Challenge uh, since they uh, so graciously agreed to uh, hop over to the afternoon. Uh, so we'll uh, lead with them, uh, followed by the Harney County Wildfire uh, Collaborative and the Oregon Collaborative Program, CCAA for sage grouse, and then Oregon SageCon. Uh, and then we'll wrap up at uh, 4 p.m. Mountain Time. So appreciate everyone coming back for that. If you're not able to join us, um, just a reminder that if you're involved in the breakout groups, they occur next week, uh, May 12th through the 14th. You should have received a message yesterday from Sam Stiber. Uh, telling you about those breakout groups and confirming the one that you are involved in, uh, whether you're an active participant or a listener. So please let us know if you have not received any notification for those yet. Um, but we're very much looking forward to that. And then just so that you know, the recordings from today's presentations will be posted on May 7th onto our online site. And I believe that was posted in the Q&A, the link to that. So if you want to take a look. Uh, so I think we are ready to wrap up, Liz, unless there are other questions that I'm not seeing for Marvin. No, no other questions. Okay, well then thank you again, Marvin, thank you so much. That was a really, really terrific presentation and a lot to think about. Um, and for those who have been joining us uh, all morning, we had up to about 112 people. So very exciting for that. Thank you for joining us and we will look forward to seeing you back with us at uh, 2 p.m. Mountain. Thank you very much. Yeah, by all means. Okay. All right. Well, hello everyone and thank you for joining the afternoon session. We had a really great morning session of, um, of examples of successful collaborative approaches, um, some really interesting and thought-provoking techniques and, and processes that, uh, that people are using. So we're very excited to, uh, to hear more from this afternoon about that. Um, just want to note, uh, be, I'm going to cover just a couple of introductory uh, pieces of information in, in case we have people joining us this afternoon who are not there this morning. And one of those is the need to uh, jot down this number that's at the bottom of your screen, 210-269-5524. In the event you have any technical difficulties uh, with either your sound or audio during the meeting, please reach out to Liz. That is her phone number and you can call or text her and she will give you a hand. So um, I'm Susan Heyman, again, facilitator with Enviro Issues. Uh, we're the, uh, the group that is helping to support the online workshops as well as the online engagement. Um, I'm joined by Liz Mack, by uh, Candace Plendel, uh, Jackie Dagger and Janelle Hull. And uh, so we are all here to uh, hope that you have a good and productive experience. Just a couple of things, again, in case you're new and haven't uh, been on Zoom uh, anytime lately, just want to touch on a couple of things. Again, um, we're recording this meeting and we are posting these to our online engagement site and we will be showing you that site, uh, the link to that later. I believe it is also going to be posted in the Q&A uh, panel. So we'll make sure that you have that available uh, so that you can pull that link up if you need. Um, the recordings for this particular meeting, uh, though it says May 6th on your uh, screen there, uh, this 
this set of meetings will actually be posted by the 7th. We may get them tomorrow, but just in case, we'll, we'll guarantee that they'll be there by the 7th. Um, we'll have everyone muted during the call just to manage the background noise. Um, and, and the folks who are presenting are able to unmute themselves. If you appear to be having any difficulty with that, we will help you with that. And we can also uh, manage your video uh, for those who are going to be presenting. And for those of us who are not in a speaking mode, uh, if, you are, uh, if you could just uh, turn off your webcam and then uh, only the speaker will have their webcam on and that just helps reduce the distractions as we go through the meeting. So for those of you who are in listen-only mode, a couple things I want to point out to you. At the bottom of the screen, you see the raise hand feature. We're going to invite you, if you would have any questions, that you click on that and raise your hand. You can also submit any questions uh, through the Q&A panel here. And if you click on that, uh, this pops up and you're able to type your question in and you can send your question anonymously. Uh, if you choose not to make it anonymous, um, then we'll know who sent it. And the advantage there is if we get uh, type for time and we're not able to get to all the questions, then we can get back to you specifically because we'll know that you submitted the question. Um, but please feel free to use that. Uh, the presentations won't be interrupted by questions, but we are going to try to have a few minutes at the end of every pre presentation to take some questions. Uh, so again, for today, please note the phone number for Liz if you need to uh, get any help with technical assistance. Uh, we also just want you to be aware that um, not only the breakout groups, but the material from this meeting, all of these case studies today and the presentations yesterday are located on this website, sagebrushconservationworkshop.participate.online. And usually you'll proceed that with your HTTPS backslash backslash. But I believe if you type this in, uh, you'll be able to pull that up. And again, we'll try to have that link on the, in the Q&A so that that's easy for you to reach. So I believe with that, um, oh, quick, quick agenda review. We did a little adjustment at the end of our uh, morning session. And thank you so much to Charlie and Jason for allowing us to move them to the start of the afternoon session. We had a little bit uh, lighter afternoon session for number of presentations. So this just gave us a little bit more room. So thank you for that. So you can see um, the presentations that will be provided. And all of the speakers are either the leaders of or very engaged in the case studies that they are sharing. And we really appreciate their expertise and the interest and passion that they bring uh, to these topics. So thank you um, all to all of the presenters for the presentations that you've put together. We're excited for those. All right, I think with that, um, I am ready to stop talking and I would be uh, very pleased to turn this over to Charlie Sanford, who's a biologist with Fish and Wildlife Service, and Jason Pyron, who is a supervisory biologist, I believe, also with Fish and Wildlife. Um, I understand, Charlie, that you are uh, principally going to be presenting, uh, and so we are ready when you are ready. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Susan. Thanks, Tom. And thanks, everyone, for, uh, for adapting to our new situation. Um, Jason and I were both originally going to uh, be presenters when these were in-person meetings, uh, but logistically, it made more sense for just uh, one of us to, to, uh, to present. Uh, so, um, yeah, I was going to make a joke right before lunch that I had the coveted pre-lunch spot uh, where everybody is already tuning out and thinking about what's coming up. But instead, I get the uh, slightly less coveted immediately after lunch spot where everyone's probably starting to doze off. Uh, so I'll do my best to move through this, uh, maybe get us a little bit closer to schedule um, and maybe keep you guys entertained. Um, I'm here to talk about a semi novel approach uh, that's just getting off the ground in Idaho. Uh, as, as Tom mentioned in his introduction this morning, there's really a saying that there's not really such thing as a new idea. In, that may be uh, mostly true for this. Uh, we're actually, it's, I would say we're a compendium of a bunch of ideas that have been floating around and, and they've all aligned correctly to where uh, we're able to get uh, a, a semi-novel uh, approach off the ground. Um, as you can see, we've titled this the, the Cheatgrass Challenge. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, it's a snappy name, uh, but we're not just talking about cheatgrass here. We're talking about our, our typical invasive annual grasses, Medusa, Ventanata, and cheatgrass. Uh, just invasive annual grasses didn't have as catchy of a name. Uh, and I'm sure most people probably rolled their eyes or cringed when I said cheatgrass. You know, at this point, it's a pervasive threat in the Western U.S. Uh, that uh, most people have just learned to live with. Um, but cheatgrass is, is still expanding and it's still taking over Idaho's rangelands, uh, increasing wildfire size and frequency, reducing forage productivity, and threatening wildlife habitat and rural economies. Um, as though not as pervasive or well known, other annual grasses like Medusa head and Ventanata may be even more problematic if left unchecked. Uh, in short, all of these grasses increase our fire risk and decrease forage and habitat to both livestock and wildlife. Uh, next slide, please. And so, like I alluded to, uh, you know, it's a cheatgrass and inv annual, in, invasive annual grasses are pervasive. Um, and so, a lot of people have thrown their hands up in the air and said, it is what it is. Uh, but there's people who are still at it. And uh, one of the questions we want to address is, is why haven't these past efforts been working? Well, if we think about cheatgrass uh, or invasive annual grasses uh, as, as a bus that we are all trying to push, we all agree it's stuck and we want to move it. One of the issues we're having is everyone's pushing a bus, but it's not the same bus. So everyone's working in these rangelands trying to address the cheatgrass challenge, but we're all shotgunning approach. So if we were able to all get behind the same bus one at a time and push those buses out, those cheatgrass issues, those invasive annual grass issues out, uh, we'd probably have a larger success. More hands make light work. Um, however, until such time that we do that, you know, we're reacting to, uh, um, what would we call them? Emergencies on the rangeland where we have a problem here, let's get after it. And while we're over there, something else is going on. And so we need to start focusing in our, our plan of attack uh, and, and uh, stopping the wholesale conversion of sagebrush rangelands. So that means we have to start thinking differently. Um, so a shout out to Lindy Garner and Jeremy Maestas. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, we probably already all saw this, uh, this slide. Um, invasive Species Management 101 teaches us that we need to be proactive. Uh, and when, when we're in that bottom left of that chart here is when we're in early stages of invasion where it's relatively cheap uh, and quick to address the invasion. As we start to lose control or as annual grasses start to become more well established, we move into a longer term management phase where it's going to be more costly and our, our it's gonna take a longer time to see that success. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, issues are also informed by the landscape ecology. Uh, you know, context matters. As, as a blue landowner on the left side of this uh, image, surrounded by red, uh, red representing the annual grass uh, infested areas, we can try as hard as we want and stay after it. And we can probably keep our square blue but we're always gonna have, have to be working after it. And that's not the fault of the landowners around us. That's the nature of invasive annual grasses is they are persistent. However, if we were to be a red square on the right and we wanted to get rid of our invasion, uh, our odds of success are much higher because we are already surrounded in the landscape context of relatively uninvaded rangelands. So if we concentrate our effort on expanding those blues we can start to convert an entire grid uh, to blue and only have to move red square to red square and not have to look back and retreat. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide, please. Um, and then common sense teaches us that teamwork matters. So however you wanna say it, teamwork makes the dream work, whatever, the whole is greater than some of the parts. Um, we all have quotes like these pounded into our head but how we engage in teamwork also matters. It's not just that we're on a team, it's that we're on a team playing together. So if you were to liken this for, for another metaphor is, is shifting our focus from being uh, an Easter egg hunt, dashing out and trying to find all these problems and fix them to a football team. We are all trying to move the ball down the field. So 
This team of agencies and partners came together, and I stress this, in person uh, to figure out how to move the needle. What are we all doing cumulatively across the board and what could we all be doing together? And, and I stress the in-person meetings is because it is really important as we've learned and, and we've seen from all of our discussions today included is to have that interaction of not just what's on the agenda, but the sidebars, the building the trust, the understanding why we're doing what we're doing. And so, um, like I said, we've had uh, in-person meetings, a half a dozen or more over the past year, and they're regularly scheduled where we talk about what are the projects we see on the horizon? Who are landowners that we see that are in the context of our landscape, uh, BLM, forest service, private land, um, and how can we engage everybody? State lands, I think I saw at least a half a dozen of the people in this slide represented in our attendees list today. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So one of the conversation starters, or one of the, one of the things that got us talking all on the same page was this rangeland analysis platform produced by uh, Brady Allred and Matt Jones out of the University of Montana. Um, and what this is, is it's remote sensing data that, uh, that is trained by on the ground data from BLM and NRCS, and it's trained by year. And so we have pretty reliable data on what's on the ground and we can scale that up. And so we can see in the, in the right side of this image is we can actually start to color code our maps by our percent cover of annual forbs and grasses, perennial forbs and grasses, uh, shrubs and trees. And, and we can start to actually see a more landscape context of areas where we might want to consider working. Uh, next slide, please. So from that previous exercise uh, of, of seeing that landscape context, we saw that we could combine the concepts of invasive species management, landscape ecology, and teamwork, and put them into a proactive spatial strategy. Instead of just always reacting to where cheatgrass is bad, we're now able to find those places that are still relatively intact, address them and keep them that way. That way we can then move forward out into areas that maybe need a little bit more attention and not have to look back over our shoulder and see if we need to retreat an area we've just finished. We know that preventative care is less expensive and, a more, success and more successful than an emergency room care. I mean, the example here showing it's much cheaper and much easier to go to a doctor and hear some inconvenient news than be in an emergency room. If we start somewhere intact or vulnerable, we can achieve some control and feel more confident that we step out and don't have to look back and re-engage. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the recent uh, massive lift with conifers, this would be similar to starting in phase one and pushing towards a phase three. The, the difference now is we're in slightly less charismatic. You can really see a landscape change with, with junipers or conifers, excuse me. So uh, next slide, please. So we used the rangeland analysis platform to, to identify relatively intact core areas with lower cover of annuals uh, and identify transition zones where shrublands are actively shifting to annuals at large scales. Uh, large areas dominated by moderate to high annuals were characterized as our annual grass region. And we can kind of see that division in the green being our core, yellows and oranges are transition and our red are, is a relatively stable state. And you'll notice uh, in this, the, the left-hand picture of Idaho, there's some white spots. Those are large areas of urban development and, and agriculture that we excluded from the map. Um, on the right, we can see what fed this map is that conflict map of our red zones and the right map are actually areas that are transitioning. Our blue areas are stable. And so we can use that data to say, okay, where is our conflict? What direction is our spread going? And how do we engage? Uh, next slide, please. So the core area represents regionally intact rangelands as characterized by low cover of annual grasses. Local areas of higher annual grass cover may be present within the region, uh, but the overall inv invasion is still relatively low. So this is again, this is that left-hand curve of the invasive management 101. 
where local management in these areas is more likely to be effective at maintaining sagebrush rangelands in the long run because of the already favorable landscape context. The annual grass region, uh, that red zone, just the other end of the spectrum, uh, this region is primarily along the Snake River Plain. Uh, it's dominated by moderate to high cover of annual grasses. Uh, some rangelands may have converted to an annual grassland state where they're stable as an annual grassland. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean desirable, excuse me. Um, local areas of lower annual grass cover may be present within the region, but their long-term integrity is compromised by occurring in a setting surrounding, excuse me, setting of higher invasive annuals. Again, these would be those red square or blue squares surrounded by red, red squares. Frequent fires and reinvasion from neighboring areas make maintenance of sagebrush rangelands extremely difficult in this context. And then in between the core and the annual grass region is again the transition zone. Those are areas between, excuse me, those are areas that are considered uh, to be undergoing ecosystem state changes at landscape scales where uh, there's more variability of dominance of annuals versus dominant of natives and shrublands. But these are the important battlefronts for stemming annual grass conversion uh, while also being areas of high unpredictability for management due to the rapid change uh, that is going on. A, a disturbance could really, really dictate which way the needle turns. So our team developed this strategy of defending the core, which is to defend those green areas from annual grass conversion as our top priority for management anchoring our efforts where we can f win easily and then move out. These are areas where it's uh, lower investment, early and aggressive control uh, through the uh, eradication of invasives and promotion of perennial grasses. Those are areas where we can, we can, we may have to revisit, but our, our investment is significantly lower than other regions. The next strategy is to grow the core. Uh, while cores are being defended, a secondary priority is to push outward. Uh, sustained effort, including large scale restoration, is needed in these areas to halt that push uh, of, of cheatgrass into the cores. However, having anchored at the core, we can now push out. Uh, and then finally is the mitigate impacts. You know, we're not walking away from the annual grass regions. They will still be on the radar of most or of all land management agencies and private landowners. Um, but we need to think about what tools we use to mitigate the most severe impacts uh, of the cheatgrass fire cycle, particularly. Primary actions in this region may include just asset protection, fine fuels reduction, and rehabilitation and maintenance of perennial grasses. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, of course it's, uh, we, need to, we need to further prioritize where to, where to work. Uh, and that's up to our local stakeholders and partners to prioritize that. You know, we, we have this satellite imagery and we have these high elevation uh, concepts of our landscapes, but it's a team of about 12 people that are expected to know the whole state. And that's, that's certainly never gonna be the case. We defer to our local uh, level stakeholders and partners to inform us of issues that maybe we haven't seen yet. And so there's a ton of uh, information that you might want to pull into that, that, that our stakeholders feed us, local knowledge, vegetation data, resource values, risk maps, uh, that resistance resilience mapping, um, sage grouse priority areas, big game habitat, you name it, any information that helps us refine uh, where we need to go next. Um, and then uh, concentrating management in specific geographies also helps us make measurable outcomes more likely, uh, as opposed to that shotgun approach postage stamp ideas. When we can start to block up land, regardless of ownership uh, that we're working in, our odds of success go up and our price tag generally goes down. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this, this is probably old hat to a lot of f folks is, is this isn't just eradicating invasive annuals. This isn't a one and done. We're, we're also managing for perennials, whether that's through seeding or just uh, uh, altered grazing systems, you name it, whatever we can do to also manage for perennials. 
Uh, next slide, please. And so this is an example of, of what actions our land managers can take and often what discussions that we have in these meetings is where are we in those early uh, transition stages where we can be doing prevention, uh, early detection and rapid response, get out, address the problem and move on. Uh, what areas are more suited for restoration and management where we need to be aggressive post fire, get in, uh, get some native seed in the ground and monitor those areas. And then containment and mitigation. <clears throat> Again, this would fall more in the annual grass region where we're looking at fine fuels reduction through strategic grazing or fuel breaks uh, or large scale uh, thinning projects, uh, what have you. Uh, next slide, please. So what does success look like? Um, well, first of all, it's setting realistic expectations and timeframes uh, for recovery of desired conditions. Uh, and that's essential because this is a long-term commitment. This isn't a one and done. We're gonna have to keep with it. Much like conifer removal, as I said earlier, when you cut those trees, there's still seeds in the ground that are gonna come up. When we address invasive annuals, there's still seeds in the ground that are gonna come up. So we emphasize that we have to stick with this. We need long-term funding and we need long-term commitments from all of our partners. Uh, we emphasize that stakeholders can really help with coordination and prioritization and getting large scale demonstrations going. Again, success will be based on the proof that we bring to the table. Um, additionally, successes can be measured, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as financial buy-in by partner agencies. So far we've leveraged nearly $1 million for our initial rollout and we're optimistic of opportunities but certainly aware that we've attracted attention and we need to prove, uh, prove our concept. Um, so this is year one of our rollout. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the agencies meet regularly. Uh, project applications for this year are due on May 15th, the end of next week, at which point, again, uh, the stakeholders, the partners in the Cheatgrass Challenge Committee will get together We'll figure out what, what projects we can fund, how they fit in the landscape context and where we can go from there. And hopefully by this time next year, we'll have reportables of how working together across, uh, across fence lines and meeting and discussing projects regularly, hopefully we'll be discussing how that's been a win for us. Uh, so if you wanna go to the next slide again, please. So I just wanna reiterate uh, a shared vision of addressing the problem of invasive annual grasses isn't new, but how we address the problem as a collective unit of agencies and partners is. All the agencies listed here meet regularly to address what we're doing to address cheatgrass so that we can prevent opportunities from falling through the cracks. We discuss what everybody knows is going on and where maybe we could build on a project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so I want to conclude, hopefully I'm uh, slightly ahead of schedule, um, but I want to conclude with a quote from Aldo Leopold. I listened carefully for clues whether the West has accepted cheat as a necessary evil to be lived with until kingdom come, or whether it regards cheat as a challenge to rectify its past errors in land use. I found the hopeless attitude almost universal. There is, as yet, no sense of shame in the proprietor of a sick landscape. You know, those are strong words, but I think those are meant more of as a challenge. And I, I certainly interpret them as a challenge of proving Mr. Leopold wrong and saying, we're still fighting this battle years after he's said that quote, but we have every intention of winning and we're at least going to give it all we've got. We certainly haven't, uh, <clears throat> um, we've certainly taken ownership of the issue. Uh, and with that, I think there's one last slide, uh, some links to some of the data, the resources, um, the Idaho Cheatgrass Challenge landing page, which can be found on the NRCS website, uh, the rangeland analysis platform, and uh, some Idaho specific cover that from the rangeland analysis platform that gave us that core uh, transition and annual grass and, uh, zones. And I think with that, I could probably have a little time for questions. Yes, you definitely can have time for questions. Thank you very much, Charlie. That was uh, informative and it was entertaining, I have to say. So you met, met the mark on as far as that goes. 
We have um, several questions submitted, so I know we can at least get to a handful of these. Um, the first is from Jill Randall. How was soil data used and incorporated into the regional team priorities? Is it different than R and R mapping? So we we definitely use both. Um, the the R and R mapping gives us a, a kind of a, a core scale, kind of like the uh, the RAP map of knowing understanding landscapes and where they fit on the spectrum of R and R. Uh, but but as applications come in from those local uh, groups, generally NRCS focus groups or uh, landowners or fishing game, as those applications come in, we also look at soil classifications and understanding what we are capable of achieving so that we don't set our expectations, not necessarily too high, but in, a, in the wrong spot. Uh, understanding where we are and where we need to go based on what soil will let us do. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, another question, this one from John O'Keefe. You said get some native seed in the ground. Do you see a role for non-native and parentheses crested wheat? <laughs> uh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> you know, there's a time and a place for everything. Um, I think that might be most appropriate to leave it at that. Uh, it all depends on what the land management, the land owners priorities are and their objectives are. Uh, we, we know that cheatgrass and medusa head and ventanata are, are threats to our systems. Um, and if, if there are landowners whose, whose priorities don't align with ours, we assess and, and determine next steps. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, Dolly Edmonds uh, submitted, this is exciting. How will you be reaching out to let stakeholders know about your successes and lessons learned? What outreach strategy do you have planned? So we have, we are graced uh, by cooperating with the NRCS as, as almost a hosting agency. We are graced to have their um, public relations staff, as well as most agencies, <clears throat> excuse me, participating agencies staff um, to, to help roll out those success stories. Uh, hopefully we'll have this conversation next year or one similar to it where we can roll this out. Um, I know that there is also the Sage West uh, uh, listserv, email listserv that we can share successes. Um, right now we're focused on rolling it out. <laughs> uh, and so hopefully by this time that will be a, a, a question that is very pressing to us. Great. I think we might be able to get at, at least another another one or two in. Um, this next one from uh, Ali Duval, uh, Charlie and community, super great presentation. Uh, the Idaho Cheatgrass Challenge is a brilliant state-led collaborative initiative that we can all support and learn from. My question, if large scale demonstration projects are needed, can you elaborate on where and when, or pardon me, on where and what is needed to make this happen? So, Excuse me. Uh, yeah, I mean, so when we think of large scale demonstration, one of the one of the key things about demonstration is it needs to be accessible. When we take folks out to show them a win is we need to be able to go somewhere that isn't going to be uh, super remote or, or, or difficult to drive to um, and at a scale where we can really take in the, the context. Um, but that's again, that's dependent on much of this program is voluntary. So that's dependent on whether or not we have landowner investment, neighboring state BLM, forest service investment. And so these all factors are cumulative that'll tell us where these projects are. You know, certainly we, that core area and that transition zone would be great to see a conversion from the yellow, the transition to a green, uh, somewhere where we can show it off quickly and easily. Uh, but the willingness of the landowners will, will be what dictates that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have actually <clears throat> more questions than we can get to. So we're going to have a couple that we will save for you, Charlie, but maybe the last one, because it could be um, particularly instructive for the breakout groups next week. How did you deal with the funding from different agencies and were you able to pool the dollars? So, 
yes and no on the pooling of the funds. Um, there are certain there are certain funds that we can't pool. Um, for instance, the Fish and Wildlife Service, we have partners for Fish and Wildlife funds that we can commit to private landowners uh, in a project in the context of a larger project, um, but we can't just put it into the bank account with, with another project. So um, we've also applied for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's uh, sagebrush ecosystems grant uh, which is a little bit more of a pooled fund it's got NRCS and BLM funds in it where where we can more readily uh, leverage uh, funds across land ownerships um, but part of this committee is understanding part of the cheatgrass challenge team is understanding where we have those issues and where maybe someone says okay I can pay for this chunk well we can pay for this chunk and then stitching those together um, where necessary. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Charlie. Sure appreciate it. Um, and again, very thought-provoking things that uh, I'm sure will come up in the discussion next week with the breakout groups on invasive species. So thanks, thanks again. You bet. We are going to go ahead. Oh, and again, uh, for folks that ask questions that I didn't get to uh, bring to Charlie, we will circle back with him and. Uh, see if we can get a response to you and then make sure that we get that posted on the website as well. <clears throat> so our next presentation is on the Harney County Wildfire Collaborative. And so we have Brenda Smith, uh, Executive Director and Ben Kate, uh, Ecological uh, Coordinator for the High Desert Partnership. So welcome to both of you. And let's get your presentation going here. And I think we are ready then, Brenda, when you are. Great. Well, thank you all. Uh, we appreciate the invitation to present uh, to WAFWA and a special thanks to Tom for reaching out uh, to us to speak about the Harney County Wildfire Collaborative. When Tom asked me to present, I, uh, because, because High Desert Partnership is a collaborative organization, I quickly uh, roped in my, one of my team members at High Desert Partnership, Ben Kate, who's our ecological initiatives coordinator, and he's gonna be doing uh, most of the presenting today, but uh, we've basically broken the presentation into, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about what High Desert Partnership is and where we're located, and then Ben's gonna launch into um, uh, the efforts of the Harney County Wildfire Collaborative. So with that, next slide. So just a frame of reference, um, High Desert Partnership uh, works in Harney County, Oregon. We're in southeastern Oregon. Um, we are uh, a county of 10,000 square miles with about 7,300 uh, residents uh, scattered across um, the county, primarily uh, you know, natural resource-based communities. And um, interestingly, uh, land ownership is about 75% uh, federal at, or uh, government managed, 25% uh, private. So big chunk of the ground is uh, federal managed. We, uh, we're considered the high desert and uh, ecosystems, and we're um, kind of smack dab in uh, the sagebrush sea of the northern Great Basin. Um, next slide. So High Desert Partnership is a, uh, a nonprofit that operates in Harney County. Uh, we've been in existence for about 15 years, and we're really about uh, bringing folks together to find common ground. Um, and we do that by supporting a number of initiatives. Uh, we, we have a forest collaborative, we have a wetlands initiative, uh, the, the wildfire collaborative, which you're going to hear about today. But um, we're interested in, you know, this holistic um, solving problems, complex problems holistically. So we also have a youth initiative and interested in creating opportunities for our youth in Harney County, as well as, as growing uh, our rural economy. The next slide. 
And Brenda, you are scooting out of the screen. Yep, if you could. Yeah. We're on the floor here because Ben and I are trying to social distance. Oh, well then, you know, I wondered about that. So you do whatever you need to do to keep yourself safe. <laughs> Oh, so uh, we'd like to think that, uh, you know, working together is a bit of a culture in Harney County. We've, uh, we've been uh, bringing collaboration and uh, diverse partners together for a number of years. Um, but, uh, but our partners are just not our community members. It's, it's all those that have a stake in Harney County that, uh, that, uh, you know, basically have a concern for um, this area. And our team uh, is uh, a team of, of seven right now, and we, we do all kinds of things to support our partners in collaboration. And among those things, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, is uh, is, is really trying to be consistent in our support. So uh, one thing that we do is that when we have collaborative meetings, we always have professional facilitation. Um, ben works um, hard across all of our ecological initiatives. Uh, as a liaison between funders and partners, we do help our partners find funding. Um, we identify who needs to be at the table and, and do all we can to bring folks to the table. Uh, we also do um, outreach and communications. So all of our uh, collaboratives, we uh, have a communications coordinator who, who helps in that um, effort as well. So with that, um, that's just sort of a brief introduction to our organization, High Desert Partnership. And Ben's gonna talk to you all about our, our wildfire collaborative. So thanks. All right, next slide, please. So uh, thanks for the introduction, Brenda. And now on to the formation of the Wildfire Collaborative. So uh, this effort was really pulled together out of the fact that over the course of just a couple of years, uh, between the Holloway fire, the Miller Homestead fire, the Buzzard Complex fire between 2012 and 2014, uh, over a million and a half acres of sage step habitat burned in Harney County. Um, <clears throat> and the uh, Wildfire Collaborative was formed at the end of 2014. Move on to the next slide, please. So the purpose and focus of the group is to reduce the potential for and the impact of mega fires in Harney County and the restoration of sagebrush rangeland uh, in Southeast Oregon and mega fires. We're talking about these large scale 100,000 plus acre fires and the picture there in the background, uh, as far as the eye can see, that is all black. It's a little difficult to see in the picture, but there is uh, no vegetation on those hills. Uh, next slide, please. So a few of the partners are our local rangeland fire protection associations. I'll refer to those as RFPAs from uh, here on out. And you guys had a presentation about that this morning. So hopefully you got a little bit of background on RFPAs. Uh, we have federal, tribal, state, county agencies, conservation organizations, uh, scientific community and the ranching community. Uh, all working together to try to figure out uh, how best to tackle these large scale uh, mega fires. So next slide. A little bit about the collaborative. Uh, they identified the need for a different type of con conversation around fire. Uh, basically the status quo wasn't working very well. Uh, and they wanted to better understand the issues related to why these fires were getting so large um, and burning with such high intensity. And they really uh, found three topics related to wildfire that they could address. Uh, suppression, and that is how to be more effective at suppressing fires that start. Uh, prevention, prevent, how to prevent fires that do start from uh, becoming large scale fires. And then restoration, uh, how to best recover from large scale fires when they do occur. And when we're talking about recovery, 
Uh, we really are talking ecological recovery, but also the social and economic impacts uh, that come with a large scale mega fire. Uh, like Brenda mentioned, we're a natural resource based economy and uh, the grazing resources uh, in the Sage Step are really crucial to a lot of the ranching economy that happens here in Harney County. So uh, next slide, please. So the first step the Wildfire Collaborative uh, chose to tackle was suppression. Uh, they needed to tackle this first to build relationships. Uh, at the time, there were really strained relationships between our RFPAs and our federal uh, firefighting agencies. Um, so they're, oh, sorry. Um, Yeah, so there were strained relationships. Uh, they really weren't uh, operating together. They were literally not on the same uh, radio frequencies. Uh, so pulling together the RFPAs with the uh, federal agencies was huge. Um, these RFPAs are often the first responders to fires uh, based on their proximity uh, and their location in the most rural parts of the county. Um, Harney County has six RPAs and a total of 178 firefighters with a boundary of 3.8 million acres. So these are in really, really rural areas that are difficult for agency staff to get to. And the RPAs are, are often the first ones to get to fires to start. Um, go ahead and move to the next slide. So the goal is to create a cohesive firefighting resource. Um, establishing a shared knowledge of the current conditions and reviewing the fire history in Harney County. So um, this gets at how the frequency and size of fires have changed through time and what factors are driving those changes. Um, mega fires result for different reasons in different habitats and things like how we manage the landscape over the past 150 years with our suppression efforts, um, conversion to invasive annual grasses, uh, warming, changing climate. Um, so really getting a common understanding of the issues around mega fires. Uh, they clarified an MOU between RFPAs and federal agencies um, and developed creative ways to share training, um, communications tools, equipment, things like that. And it really resulted in a lot better relationship between our agency, firefighting resources and the RFPAs. And it ultimately resulted in the creation of a new position that is a liaison position uh, housed in the Burns Interagency Fire Zone that is sort of a, the middleman between our RFPA resources and our agency fire resources. Uh, we'll move to the next slide. Next thing that they uh, chose to tackle in the realm of suppression was a network of remote uh, cameras for increasing uh, response time and the ability to detect fires quickly when they do start. So this is a, a camera that is uh, publicly accessible. Um, so anybody can go online and look at the image uh, that's being displayed and this effectively crowdsources uh, fire observation. So you can look at that website hit a button that says report and report a fire to an agency. Um, agency staff has the ability to move the camera to point in a specific direction to uh, basically be able to uh, locate fires faster in the really, really remote areas of Southeast Oregon. Um, next slide. So after tackling the suppression issue, working better with RFPAs, um, getting a series of uh, remote cameras set up, they moved on to prevention. And this really talks about keeping fires from becoming large when they do start. Uh, in Harney County, over 80% of fires are started by lightning. So we know that we're not going to stop all fires from starting, um, but only a small percentage of those fires become these large scale mega fires. Um, and the national policy direction in relation to sage grouse uh, management, fire was identified as one of the key threats to sage grouse. And at the time that the wildfire collaborative was forming, that was uh, a really big issue that they were trying to tackle. 
Um, next slide. So the sort of the way that they went about uh, the prevention issue was to identify a pilot project to work on. And the approach they went with here is to protect the best of the best. So what is our biggest, best, most valuable sage grouse habitat, most intact sagebrush step ecosystem um, in our area? And uh, they've, I, they identified the Pueblo Mountain uh, range in Southeast Oregon, kind of on the uh, Oregon, Nevada border. And this area was pretty large. Uh, it was too big to be considered a pilot project, uh, totaling almost 220,000 acres. And so they established a subcommittee to work on uh, sort of narrowing that down. And they broke, they broke that 220,000 acre area into seven smaller subunits and I identified values, threats, and resources for each of those subunits and ranked them according to uh, project criteria. So you move to the next one, please. So this is just a picture of the uh, sage grouse packs in Oregon, priority areas for conservation. And then the little uh, oval kind of at the bottom of the screen there is the area that they they chose to work. Yep. So I can move on to the next slide. So this is going to be a zoom in of that uh, that area. If you can click the next, it's not the next slide. There's a series of uh, things here. So there's a road that was identified um, that they wanted to work on, and. The, where they, the subunit they chose to work on was a total of 26,000 acres they were trying to protect uh, with an actual proposed treatment of just 2,000 acres right along that roadway. So the, the image you're looking at now is um, a fire transmission model. So it's basically a map showing the likelihood of fire spreading through an area. And the red is high likelihood of fire transmission. And so they, they're looking at this roadway as being essentially uh, a, a highway for fire to transmit through that area. And they wanted to focus in on that area as a place to alter fuel structure in such a way that that roadway could be used as an anchor point for fire suppression efforts rather than a highway for fire spread. And so essentially creating a, a fuel break for um, Fire, fire staff to anchor off of uh, to suppress fire if it were to start in that area. Uh, let me go ahead and move to the next slide. So uh, their uh, prevention plan for this pilot project area they chose to work on along the road in the Pueblo Mountains um, is sort of a multi-tiered uh, project. And the, the idea was to alter fuel structure uh, to promote a state B, if you're thinking of the state and transition model for sagebrush, so a perennial grassland. Uh, primarily what's there now is either state A or state D, so either sagebrush dominated or annual grass dominated landscape. And so we wanted to get that to a state B, perennial grassland dominated, in order to uh, alter fire behavior, flame lengths, make it easier for firefighting resources to catch a fire on that road if there one were to start in that area. Um, so first thing that they did was improve road access. Road conditions were really horrible down there. It would take a long time for firefighting resources to get to the area um, and then implement the early detection cameras to make it quicker uh, detection times for fires when they do start. And then there was a series of treatments to alter fuel structure, which included uh, prescribed burning followed up by herbicide application of a mazepic to control annual grasses. There was brush mowing to reduce uh, the amount of sagebrush right along the roadway, which would alter fire behavior. If fire were to start there, you'd get lower flame lengths, things like that. A series of water developments along the roadway to both uh, disperse cattle a little more evenly along the road and also be a place that uh, firefighters could get water. 
um, and then targeted grazing along the roadway, followed by seeding of, uh, of perennial grasses. And so this project ultimately resulted in a Pueblo Mountain pilot project EA, um, which was approved last year and treatment started in the fall of 2019 with the prescribed burn and an herbicide treatment along that road. Uh, we're going to follow up this spring with monitoring to uh, sort of to see the effects and the success of that paired prescribed fire herbicide treatment to determine whether seeding uh, this fall should occur. So next slide, please. So after uh, the prevention, they wanted the, this group wanted to tackle restoration. Um, and they selected a second pilot project area in the Stinking Water Mountains, uh, focusing on an already imperiled site. So look at the picture in the background. Uh, this site has been burned multiple times uh, in the past 10 years. It also includes a much more diverse land ownership, uh, a lot of private and public land interface, um, and allows us to test more tools and techniques to combat uh, these megafires. You can Move to the next slide, please. So really with this map, I just wanted to show the land ownership in this area. Um, it's a pretty large landscape, a uh, project area of 320,000 acres and the blue being BLM and the white being private. So there's a good mix of public and private. Um, the NRCS is doing some work in this area around annual grasses and, and so, um, it also has the, the big three threats for sagebrush ecosystems being juniper encroachment, encroachment, invasive annual grasses, and an altered fire regime. Uh, like I said, this area has burned multiple times in the past 10 years. Um, we go ahead and move on to the next. So in the short time, the wildfire collaborative has been around since 2014. We've uh, already seen some successes which kind of hinge on building a strong trusting relationships with partners. Uh, they established agreement to alter fuel structure in a WSA in the Pueblo Mountains. Um, they've increased the functionality of between uh, RFPAs and federal agencies. And now we're moving on to more of a, a restoration focused project. Um, go ahead and move to the next slide. And so the the future for the wildfire collaborative um, in the area of megafires, we're committed to preventing fire, fires whenever possible and restoring the land when they do occur. And it's uh, the diverse group and the body of knowledge and skills and abilities of everyone that comes to the, the table for these efforts that make it possible. And I think that is it. There might be one more slide. Uh, yeah. With that, we can take a few questions if we have time. I think we ran a little long, sorry. Uh, no, I think, um, I think you are okay. We, we do have uh, a couple of minutes. I think we could take some questions. I'm super uh, anxious to see Ben, how you and Brenda are gonna just slide back and forth on that bench. It's for social distancing, but <laughs> appreciate you doing that. I'm looking up to see if we have any questions. I'm looking at any, written questions that may have come in or hands raised. Um, I don't see any. Liz, do you have any on your end that I'm not seeing? No, I don't see any yet. Okay. Give it just a minute here. I have to say, um, boy, uh, Harney County sounds like a pretty great place to live if, if uh, people are that neighborly. It's, it was very, uh, uh, was very impressive. Appreciate that. Uh, not seeing any questions then, it looks like you might be off the hook right now, but if we do get in any uh, that we need to forward to you, Ben and Brenda, we will most certainly do that. And thank you very much for the presentation. Very helpful. And again, I think terrific food for thought for the breakout groups next week. All right. So with that, we'll move on to our next presentation. And this presentation is the Oregon uh, Collaborative Programmatic CCAA uh, for sage grouse. And um, Angela, is it sites or sits? 
It sits. Thank you. It sits. Okay. Well, you know, I had a 50 50 on that. So, <laughs> um, so I will turn it over to you and, and just so that you know, and then for the folks that are listening in and watching this, uh, the video that you have a few slides down, uh, we, we are prepared to present that. Uh, everybody will need to control their own volume. It may come a little bit loud from us. <laughs> so we noticed that uh, it's, it's a little <clears throat> louder than, um, than other sounds you might be getting uh, from your computer. So if there are any issues with that, folks, just be ready when we get to that point and uh, dial your volume. So with that, Angela, uh, please. Okay, good afternoon and thanks, Susan. Um, I'm a little nervous because that first slide does not look like the slide I sent in. So I'm like, oh no, what's going on with my presentation? Hopefully everything else is still there. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna hope that too. What? <laughs> I, I said, I'm gonna hope that too. I believe, I believe that was <laughs> what we had, but uh, yeah. I know, it's, it's just the background image is different. It's the default image. It's not a big deal. It just, you know, when it pops up and it's different, you think, oh no, what am I getting into? Yes. It's, it's fine though, I'll, I'll wing it one way or another. Um, so as Susan said, I'm Angela Sitz and I'm a wildlife biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I have been working for the service for over 18 years and have spent the last nearly 10 years working on sage grouse conservation in Southeastern Oregon. Uh, much of the area that ben, Brenda and Ben were talking about in that last presentation um, is the area that I've been working on. Okay, next slide. Okay. Oops, back one. You went to. <laughs> okay. All right. So a brief, some brief background on the agreement that I'm going to talk about today. Um, it was a, a grassroots effort um, that, uh, that began back in 2011. It began during a livestock producer educational event hosted by the Oregon State University Extension when producers were fear, fearful of a potential sage grouse listing and began asking questions about CCAAs, which are candidate conservation agreements with assurances. The service was not involved in these initial discussions, but was asked to participate after the group had met a few more times to discuss the pros and cons of engaging in such an agreement. I have been representing the service since these initial discussions back in 2011. There was a diverse group of stakeholders engaged at monthly and sometimes bi-monthly meetings held in the basement of the Harney County Courthouse. The process was not formally facilitated and the agreement took about three and a half years to be developed and signed. Now I'm gonna hopefully show you a brief video that was produced by the service back in 2015 um, to talk about the CCAAs. So we'll see if the next video works. Dozens of ranchers approached the Fish and Wildlife Service about putting together a candidate conservation agreement with assurances for sage grouse in Harney County. Besides those ranchers, there was a diverse group of partners. The Soil and Water Conservation District was a key partner. They're actually the permit holder for the agreement. The federal partners were the Bureau of Land Management, Ag Research Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. The state partners included Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Department of State Lands, Oregon State University Extension, along with the Nature Conservancy. We have been uh, active for the last three and a half years in this county in developing candidate conservation agreements uh, to protect our landowners in the event of a sage grouse listing. The benefits of that program for me have been that I've received a lot of technical assistance from uh, agencies to assist me in determining what types of on the ground projects could be uh, developed to improve the habitat areas for both the sage grouse as well as for my own livestock. Uh, here in Harney County we developed the term good for the bird, good for the herd. Some of those programs have involved juniper thinning. Some have involved putting up fencing to protect riparian areas, the wet areas where the sage grouse uh, depends upon. Some of those projects have involved uh, putting some reflective markers upon the new fencing that has gone up to uh, avoid bird strikes. So we're at the beginning of it, but well on our way. All of the, the ecological issues we are dealing with 
are going to provide a dual benefit. They're going to provide a benefit to the wildlife and they're going to provide a benefit to the rancher. The major issues out here are, you know, wildfire, invasive species, and juniper encroachment. And if we can reduce and remove those threats on their lands, it's going to improve their operation and it's going to improve it for, you know, all the species that depend upon it. We have elk, and deer, and antelope, and sage grouse, among other things, wildlife, and our livestock to take care of on that land. We have uh, good local people who understand the business and understand the environment, the country, and the landscape, vegetation. We're trying to suppress the annual grasses and replace it with perennial grass. We're working hard on the Medusa head problem and the cheatgrass problem because that's our main problem on our private land. It's an ongoing battle. Involving the new science in how we manage our lands, we're able to utilize the efforts of our partners and the science, and with the rancher being the land owner, effectively get down on the ground, make these changes, which become the conservation measures that improve the habitat making water improvements, removal of juniper, treating the annual invasive types of species that could come in, preparing and to mitigate the potential of wildfires that could come through and destroy an entire area. These are all important to, to cattlemen, but they're also important to the bird. We saw the work with the Fish and Wildlife as an, a cooperative agreement of being able to sustain that business. I see us as being the original environmentalists because we have to protect the land to protect our way of life. When we show how many acres we have seeded or built bird ramps in our troughs and marked our fences, we've been doing it, but we need to show people that we're doing it. I see it as a way of preserving our way of life, really. I think partnership with the ranchers is going to be key to making these efforts successful. We need to be able to keep them on the land and keep their operations viable to maintain this habitat into the future and to keep uses on the land that are compatible with sage grouse. And CCAAs are just one piece of that puzzle. Okay, next slide before it goes to some random video. <laughs> Trying. <laughs> See if we can get that. Shut hey, down. it worked though, so that was good, and it didn't. That was my great. Room, so that was good. Yeah. Okay. Hang on here. Let me get you. There we go. Okay. Great. <clears throat> okay. So, what exactly is a CCAA? CCAAs cover candidate species. While sage grouse are no longer candidates, the agreements are still valid. At the, at the time the Oregon County CCAAs were written, the CCAA standard was as follows. When evaluating a potential CCAA, the Fish and Wildlife Service must determine that the benefits of the conservation measures to be implemented by a property owner under a CCAA, when, comprised, when combined with those benefits that would be achieved if the conservation measures were also to be implemented on other necessary properties, it would preclude or remove any need to list the covered species. The standard has changed slightly since these agreements were finalized, but these agreements fall under this standard. This agreement contains conservation measures to address th threats to sage grouse on enrolled lands. Some examples include cutting juniper, marking high risk fences, changing grazing management. At a minimum, landowners must agree to conservation measure one which states that you must maintain contiguous habitat by avoiding further fragmentation. In other words, no further development, except in the limited circumstances for ranch-related infrastructure. And you must have at least one conservation measure in place to address each identified threat. The agreements must contain monitoring provisions for both compliance and effectiveness. Enrollees can unenroll at any time with 30 days written notice, and only non-federal lands can be enrolled. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the Oregon agreements are with the local soil and water conservation districts. They hold the permit and are the agreement signers. The agreements are in place for 30 years. 
The SWCD also has privacy protections in place with landowners to ensure that their sensitive information is protected. These agreements also require baseline inventory of all enrolled <clears throat> of all lands to be enrolled, annual monitoring for compliance, and longer term monitoring to determine effectiveness of conservation measures implemented, as well as updated baseline and trend monitoring. Next slide, please. Okay, so what's in it for the landowner? Interested landowners can contact their local SWCD and the staff then work with the landowner to develop a site specific plan or SSP. The SWCD serves as the intermediary between the service and the landowner. Once the plan is approved by the service, the service issues the district a certificate of inclusion that provides the landowner with the assurances in the form of incidental take coverage should sage grouse be listed sometime in the future. This coverage assures the landowners of two things. Should the species become listed in the future, nothing further, so no further conservation actions, will be required of the land enrollees. Should incidental take occur while conducting covered activities, enrollees will be covered for that incidental take. The term covered activities refers to those activities carried out by the enrolled landowner or their representative on enrolled lands that may result in authorized incidental take of the covered species. In this case, covered activities include ongoing and planned rangeland practices, implementation of the conservation measures, and ongoing inventory and monitoring activities. Next slide, please. So this map shows the area covered by each of the agreements. I realize it's probably a little hard for folks to read, but the yellow areas are the acres of private land eligible to enroll and the pink acres are the Department of State land acres that are fully enrolled. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, so shared vision. So one of the reasons the agreement took so long to be a developed is that in 2011, when we first began working together with all the stakeholders, we lacked a shared vision. We spent much of our time arguing about what to measure. The service wanted very detailed sage grouse specific measure, metrics measured like grass height and forb density, which are extremely variable in both time and space and vary widely from year to year depending on precipitation. It took the group nearly a, a year to agree on the inventory and monitoring protocol that would be the foundation of the agreement. Key stakeholders from the Agricultural Research Service and Oregon State University Extension exist, assisted in the development of a set of simple threat-based models to be used in baseline monitoring and subsequent trend monitoring, but they also served as an important communication tool. The graphic shown here depicts the annual grass threat model, which basically divides the ecosystem into four simple boxes. These are the states that Ben was referring to in the last presentation. State A is healthy sagebrush steppe with an intact functioning, functioning understory of perennial grasses and forbs. State B is the same, same as State A, except it lacks a sagebrush overstory. State B is basically what you would expect to see if State A were to burn. State C has a vigorous sagebrush overstory, but lacks desirable understory plants and is often dominated by annual grasses like cheatgrass and medusa head. State D is an annual grassland and is what we would expect to see when State C burns. The development of these simple models allowed us to communicate with one another about the threats that livestock producers and sage grouse are both threatened by. Invasive annual grasses in the lower elevations coupled with too much wildfire and conifer encroachment in the mid and upper elevations. <clears throat> there are originally two other models that look very similar to the one shown here. One was representing areas threatened by conifer encroachment and the other, the dual threat model, where both threats are playing on the ecosystem. Next slide. So since the development of these early models, they have evolved significantly over time and have resulted in two peer-reviewed publications and one more currently under review. The one shown here is a glossy weatherproof field guide that outlines the process used to assess sagebrush steppe communities using this approach. Next slide. When folded out, the backside is a decision tree that guides managers in assessing rangelands based on the degree of threat from invasive annual grasses and conifer. Next slide. The second publication is a 33 page manager's guide that goes into more detail of how to use this assessment approach. These publications were produced in partnership with Oregon State University Extension, the Nature Conservancy, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, 
the Agricultural Research Service, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Next slide. Okay, so let's get back to those agreements and talk about the implementation progress. So since the signing of the agreements in 2014 and 2015, the districts have enrolled 45 landowners across six counties, enrolling nearly 530,000 acres of habitat within the covered area, which totals nearly 3.5 million acres, not including the Oregon Department of State land acreages, which accounts for another nearly 600,000 acres of enrolled lands. Just under half of the district acres enrolled are in core habitat, which is the same as BLM's um, priority habitat management areas or the services packs. Essentially, it's the best of the best habitat. There are approximately 120 additional landowners awaiting enrollment representing an additional 600,000 acres, which would bring the total enrollment to over 1.1 million acres within the covered area. Lack of funding and staffing is pre preventing the development of these additional plans. Next slide. So these graphics show the annual treatment acres for enrolled lands. Um, so from 2015 to 2018, there was a total treatment of juniper of 40,605 acres, um, just over 40,600 40, acres of invasive annual grass treatment. Most of that's primarily Medusa head treatment and over 48 miles of fence have been marked. Next slide. <clears throat> This is just one example showing a before on the left and an after on the right of a juniper treatment project on an enrolled property. And next slide. And this is just a, a couple photos showing um, fence marking. So this agreement has led to some unique um, collaborative opportunities. The local high school actually produces these fence markers. And then if landowners are interested, they can not only buy their fence markers from um, the, the local ag program, they can also have them install them. Next slide. All right, so ongoing challenges. The biggest challenges related to the implementation of the CCAAs has been sustainable funding and consistent staffing at the districts. To date, over $12 million has been spent on implementation, conducting baseline inventory and monitoring for all the SSPs, with the majority of these funds being spent on implementing conservation measures like juniper and annual grass control outlined in each plan. <clears throat> the primary sources of funding for these agreements has been NRCS's Sage Grouse Initiative and several of the districts received a RCPP, Regional Conservation Partnership Program grant through NRCS as well. These funds coupled with grant funding and a large focus investment partnership program grant from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board which is funded by lottery dollars in Oregon. To compound this challenge, staffing at nearly all of the districts has been extremely challenging. Many of the staff end up leaving for more stable positions, usually at partner agencies, in particular BLM and NRCS. These two challenges together have a huge impact on the overall biggest contributor to the successful implementation of the CCAAs, relationships with producers. As most of you know, creating relationships and gaining trust of those in the livestock producer communities take time. With a lack of a reliable funding for implementation and soft funded positions, it is difficult for the districts to retain high quality staff. Next slide. All right, so I realize there's a ton going on and I don't expect you to read this slide. Um, I just wanted to share this one pager with you because as previously stated, the biggest challenge with implementing agreement of this size is funding. Last fall for the annual meeting, we assisted the districts in developing this one pager to outline the inventory and long-term monitoring costs associated with each plan. For those of you that aren't familiar with SageCon, the SageCon partnership's overarching goal is to advance policies and actions that reduce threats to sage grouse and Oregon sagebrush ecosystem, as well as promote rural community and economic health. <clears throat> according to the goals, approaches, and strategies adopted in this 2015 State Action Plan. Brett's presentation, who is up next, will provide you with more details. This graphic was intended to help the districts leverage legislative funds through the state. This graphic can also be used to explain to funding partners the long-term costs associated with monitoring these agreements. Keep in mind, this graphic only outlines the long-term funding associated with baseline inventory and long-term monitoring. It does not touch on the costs associated with implementing conservation measures. However, funding conservation measures through NRCS and OWEB funding has proven to be a successful means of funding thus far. 
The service continues to work with the districts to streamline monitoring provisions, and we are currently working with the districts on the development of a database that will streamline inventory and long-term monitoring processes and reduce overall monitoring costs. Next slide. In summary, these are long-term plans with expensive commitments, and the bottom line is each mid-sized plan, which is about five to 15,000 acres, costs nearly $70,000 over the life of the plan for the baseline inventory and long-term monitoring. In my mind, if, the, if districts could at a minimum receive sustainable base funding to cover these costs, they could provide a reliable source of employment and decrease staff turnover. Staff could focus on funding conservation measures and not worry about the ongoing inventory and monitoring burden. Next slide. So overall, these agreements have been successful, but their continued success hinges on the long-term sustainable funding lev leveraged by strong working relationships between the SWCD staff, enrolled landowners, and the service. And uh, that's all I have. So I can take some questions if I didn't ramble on too long. You did not ramble on too long. That was great. Um, we do have a hand raised. Uh, Holly Kennedy, I'm going to unmute you. So you are unmuted. No, almost unmuted. Give me just a second here, Holly. I might need to get some help from Liz if uh, Liz could. It will usually pop something up that Holly probably needs to accept. Okay, so Holly, if you could take a look and see if you got a message asking you to accept being unmuted, that would be great. And then we can get to your question. There you go. Okay, Holly, I think you're able to uh, be heard now. I thought. Um, Holly, can you, it looks like you had the ability to be unmuted or that you did unmute. Liz, got any ideas? I lost Holly completely. I no longer see her in the list. So she okay. might've jumped off. <laughs> All right, could have, uh, could have just been a timing thing. Uh, so um, looking for other questions, if uh, anyone has a question to submit or raise a hand for Angela. We'll give that just a pause here. Holly had raised her hand about midway through your presentation, Angela. So hopefully we didn't, didn't just wait too long. I just didn't want to inter interrupt your presentation. So I am not seeing uh, any hands right now. Uh, so I think you are probably also off the hook for getting any questions. We certainly Great. appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you for that presentation and um, uh, as with the other speakers that we've had, really thought-provoking things to bring to the breakout groups next week. Looking forward to that. Okay, so one thing that I did not do is uh, give folks just a brief uh, couple of minutes to step away from their screens. Uh, we have one more presentation, but I would like to give people that opportunity. So why don't we just pause for maybe four minutes or so and give people a chance to stand up and, and go get a drink of water or something. Uh, and then we'll get started back here in about four minutes. And I will be sure to let people know that we are um, about to reconvene. So let's go ahead and take a pause and we'll be back in just a few minutes.
Okay, just a little bit less than a minute left. So checking in and Brett, are you about ready to present? There you are, Susan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. And will you be uh, sharing a vid or your uh, video with us or no? I am, yeah, sorry, I thought I was, there I am. Oh, there you okay. are, okay, that's great. Well, I show that we are uh, good to go whenever you are, and just because people are often interested, we have about 95 participants right now, so that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, so let me, uh, let me give you just a really brief introduction, Brett. So this is Brett Brownscombe. Many of you probably know Brett. He is the same uh, SageCon project manager, as well as uh, being affiliated with the National Policy Consensus Center at Portland State University. So please take it away, Brett. Okay. Thanks, Susan. And um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for the invitation from WAFWA to present. And um, happy to be here. And like others, um, who haven't had a haircut i'm letting the hockey hair grow and doing my best to um stay with it in the virtual world so wish we could do this in person but um by way of background i work for the national policy consensus center at portland state university it's in the hatfield school of government um we're a policy center and do a variety of project management and collaborative facilitation and um not just in the natural resources space but as the project manager for the SageCon partnership, I've worked to um, lead the coordination of the partnership along with a team of folks. So that's a bit of background. Um, next slide. Okay. Um, so kind of the who, what, and why, uh, and I threw in a little bit of how on, on what is SageCon. So, um, <laughs> If you Google it, where, where SageCon comes up as anything from an air conditioning company in Australia to a uh, block of conservative voters who are, that stem from Ohio, who are credited with helping elect President Trump. And so we are, we are neither one of those. Um, SageCon is a broad partnership in Oregon, and it's a partnership of uh, federal, state, local government, as well as local community-based organizations. Uh, tribal engagement, landowners and landowner representatives, um, and then non-governmental organizations and interests. And I say that broadly, meaning everybody from uh, conservation NGOs to um, entities like the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, the Oregon Farm Bureau, to um, hunting rec uh, recreation groups. So it's a, a broad partnership, an umbrella partnership um, of the federal agencies ranging from BLM, US Fish, NRCS, and USDA Ag Research uh, Service to all the state agencies you'd imagine um, in a statewide partnership. Everybody from um, Oregon's Department of Fish and Wildlife to our um, Department of Energy and Agriculture. Um, the what? So we're not a traditional, SageCon is in a traditional government um, body or task force, uh, we're, we're kind of, we're also not, you know, at the level of uh, Ben and Brenda uh, talked about the Hunting Wildfire Collaborative um, and Leo, the Rancher Stewardship Alliance. We're not a kind of local uh, collaborative effort like that. It's a broader statewide umbrella, uh, maybe more akin to what Bob uh, Bud talked about with the Wyoming um, Safe grass implementation team, but we're also not government appointed. Um, it's a, a more of a, an organic collaborative that's come together. Um, it started in 2010 in that era, and it really started around energy development, um, energy development in uh, southeastern Oregon and conflicts around that. And it's transitioned over time into um, a larger picture starting in 2012 with um, the Western Governors Association um, and, and governors from Wyoming and Colorado kicking off the Sage Grass Task Force and states really gearing up um, planning around the 2015 Endangered Species Act determination. So um, 
The umbrella is now related to a governor's executive order and kind of implementation of that tied to Oregon's state action plan for sage grouse, um, a state statute and rules related to mitigation and development um, land use, and then state investments, both legislative and lottery, as well as coordination across federal partners and budgets and plans and programs. And the, the why, um, there's been, whether it's been kind of in the planning phase leading up to the 2015 determination or the implementation phase, um, there's a bet around the value of organized coordination and collaboration, not just at the local level, but statewide. Um, and we're in the implementation phase now and the, the kind of need for coordination and collaboration is still um, apparent. How we work is, um, there is funding both for um, myself and other staff at the uh, National Policy Consensus Center where I work, but also through the Oregon State University Institute for Natural Resources and staff there. So we have staff support for the partnership. Um, there's a governance structure in place that I'll speak to in a bit and um, um, coordination and integration kind of efforts and processes across uh, the state that tie local up to um, higher level state actors and federal actors. And we, we work through meeting facilitation and project management or conflict resolution work, um, as well as trying to coordinate and, and tie together effective um, partnership work. We also, through OSU and other technical resources, offer that uh, technical support. So next slide. So what these are, um, I'm not going to read through. I, I think we'll pause on this slide a bit, and um, I'll talk through these um, without reading. But what's important here are the, um, over time, um, these are these are the kind of foundational pillars of what holds the partnership together. Um, you know, the first one is everybody thinks they're generally their interests are the most important, and they look through that lens. And I think um, it's worth in any collaborative effort anticipating this. Everybody's going to view it through their lens, and their lens is the most important, whether they're a rancher or an environmentalist or a developer. Um, but I think the other thing is people need to recognize that everybody feels that way and other interests feel that way too. And so we came into this with um, the recognition that, and, and I think this is what holds people together, you know, whether it's the bird and its habitat and um, problems that, that um, those interests face or whether it's rural communities and economies or um, urban rural divide and kind of government distrust people have, uh, all stakeholders have valuable interests and problems that they want to see addressed. The second pillar is, um, fortunately, certain problems are shared and, and they're mutual across people and they may have different reasons for believing something's a problem, but it's still a common problem. And the commitment that um, I think the partnership holds is that these problems um, can could all be Together, uh, to the benefit of all interests. And for Oregon, I, you know, I've bulleted the major drivers of problems, whether it's um, concerns over ranching economies or habitat and bird health or um, development potential or rural communities are, we agreed on these three. I mean, these, these are the common big ones um, that everybody can agree to and, and work on addressing. The third pillar is um, around the concept of um, just like every community and county is unique, every every state's unique. And Oregon is um, a great basin state, so we share invasive and wildfire problems. But um, Oregon's also unique, so it's it's you know it's not just the home to Ken Kesey and Portlandia TV show liberals. It's also a lot of ranching communities and conservative values that have their own vision of conservation. We're not an oil and gas state like Wyoming, and so we, we've come to this, or, or other states, um, we've come to this with a sense of um, let's work on the challenges and um, 
have the flexibility to to manage challenges in ways that are not searching for what's not there like you know we're not going to be an oil and gas state but let's focus on what is here and and, and build on the the um, foundations that have worked in the past to hold people together and um, that includes Oregon's land use planning system that dates back to the 1970s and has conservation and farm bureau kind of um, cross interest support. So we've got, you know, something to build on. And then the last pillar is just a recognition that um, we're all in this together. And I think people really recognize that um, no agency and, and uh, no entity is going to be able to solve the challenges alone that we're facing in the um, sagebrush step ecosystems. Next slide. So the um, state action plan that I mentioned is, is here. This is the um, leading up to 2015. This is where the uh, energy went. Um, we were, let me get back here, okay. We were working on a, um, you know, planning was the main focus of the partnership leading up to, you know, culminating in 2015. And so the collaborative work that um, was done through the SageCon partnership went into the development of each of the components listed on this slide. Um, so everything was done through a collaborative table and process, um, including regulations. And so the, when the Department of Fish and Wildlife did rules, um, they are about mitigation, but they also aren't just about mitigation. They, they set out habitat and population objectives and um, put into regulation the core area approach that Department of Fish and Wildlife um, advanced. The mitigation program, um, it's controversial and still is, but it was done with county planners and businesses at the table and it built on that land use foundation, um, Oregon system that I mentioned. And so it wasn't foreign to anyone to come to the table to talk about that or how to expand that foundation into covering or addressing sage grass concerns. And, um, and the mitigation program, it, it allows options that are broader than I think other states where, you know, we're, we're, um, there's developer led mitigation and mitigation banking options in Oregon. Um, banks haven't been robustly developed, but there's also an in lieu fee fund. Um, and we're, we're moving that forward. And yeah, there's, there's challenge to that and difficulty, but everybody recognized at the outset that all this would help set Oregon up in the um, Endangered Species Act listing determination. And then I, I wanted to, finally, I wanted to mention the um, Candidate Conservation Agreements. Angela spoke to those directly and um, it's millions of acres and, and also the State Department of Lands enrolled about 600,000 additional acres in a Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances as well. So, um, that's some of the planning history and, and now we're into the implementation uh, phase and that's the focus of the partnership and it's a different animal than planning. Um, next slide. So certain things here, I'll, I'll just try to go through this one quickly. Certain things have stayed the same, whether focused on planning or implementation in the partnership. And that's, you know, the vision and the mission, for example, um, it's always been about economy, conservation, and community and, and blending values um, to expand reach together. And um, it's also been about that venue uh, for a partnership that can provide a space where different interests can really come together. Um, the things that are different in the implementation world um, include some of the outputs and deliverables and activity areas. Um, Overall, I, I think a central table has remained really important for coordinating across the range. Um, but it's really in the implementation phase of things, it's really the local efforts that really matter. And so things that Brenda and Ben and uh, Angela spoke to, as well as Marvin on the Rangeland Protection Associations, it's um, the spaces that, that get action to the ground and those activities um, as well as the provision of technical support and needed capacity to help things along. Um, 
and filling the gaps uh, and, and addressing barriers to, you know, amplifying local meaningful work. That's kind of where we're focused now on the implementation side of things versus in planning, you know, um, planning and policy tends to often put the big chiefs, the big elected chiefs in um, center stage. And I think implementation is more about ensuring the, the big chiefs and the local actors are communicating and coordinated effectively um, in moving resources and decisions and capacity into priority work. And that's what we're trying to do as a partnership. So this slide, next slide, um, this slide is, is um, it shows that kind of umbrella nature of the partnership in a different way. So the orange bubbles on the right represent the high level uh, SageCon collaborative governance structure pieces. Uh, the gray ovals are, they represent three key types of work where the partnership is really trying to um, be there to focus on coordination and capacity and resources and communication. And then the left side of the slide are the, um, that's where the actual work is, is being done um, and how it relates to the, those three key As a partnership, we try to focus on the types of work that are in those um, gray bubbles. We have a governance structure and you know, different workspaces to do it, but it's a lot of the local actors and local efforts um, out in, in um, rural communities that are doing the real work. Um, so, you know, you can see in those boxes on the left-hand side of the screen, um, the local action boxes where you would find the things that Brenda and Ben are doing with uh, Harney Wildfire Collaborative and um, where you would find local BLM and NRCS and state agency local staff um, and where the CCAA is working with landowners uh, along with soil and water conservation districts. Those are in, those are local actors. A um, couple other things to mention on this, uh, the research monitoring and adaptive management piece is, um, it's a mix of, you know, we're, we're try, we try to coordinate uh, within the partnership on a mix of effectiveness and verification type monitoring and, you know, what is working, what's not. Um, adapting practice to reflect research and it involves the work of partners like uh, ARS and Oregon State University Extension um, on the research end and BLM with, uh, with with AIM protocols and plots on the ground um, population efforts and adopt elect programs um, in monitoring work team spaces our communication is um, both external and internal. And so there's, um, we have uh, thankfully some paid capacity to help with getting information out and, and outreach um, internal to the SageCon distribution list. It's a 300 or so um, person distribution list across agencies and non-agency um, um, people. And um, we have some capacity to do that. It's also external where um, we put communications and outreach work into communicating with media policymakers. Um, we do an annual state action or, or bi, uh, biennial state action report. And we're uh, working on bringing capacity and help into uh, the conservation effectiveness database or Everett's database rather and uh, coordinating with other partners like the partners in the SAGE program. So I'll move to the next slide here. This is um, just a look at the representational nature of um, one of the kind of formalized governance structures within the partnership. It's the coordinating council. And I'll just pause and let folks have a look at kind of who's on it. The intent is to keep it at a high level of decision makers, but be sure it's not just government talking to government and it's the right levels of government talking to government. So we're trying to represent the right agencies, the right levels of government, as well as um, the interests, uh, whether it's conservation, agriculture, business, landowners. Um, 
and make sure everybody feels like they have a space and a representational structure that that means something and that is kind of bound to the key decision makers um, convened by the governor's office. So next slide. This is um, this is a slide where <laughs> I want to transition into where we are now. Um, so we've been, I think the partnership overall, I mean, this is a pendulum issue and um, it'll return uh, on certain fronts, you know, certain weather is, it's just the weather and it comes and it goes, but it comes back again and um, certain themes remain. And so, you know, administration changes and federal plan revisits, um, Yes, they've been challenging and, and can destabilize collaborative agreements and momentum, but it's a bit of the nature of the weather. Um, it'll keep, we're always going to have these kinds of things and dynamics and um, the federalism question around um, regulatory approaches and ESA listings versus kind of state leadership around um, uh, state-based and voluntary approaches and whether there's the capacity to pull things off, um, or, you know, which is, which is the best route. Those debates are always here and they're kind of an underlying part of the weather. Um, development tensions uh, related to mitigation, there are certain common themes there, you know, where, um, yeah, developers would always like it to be easier and cost less and um, those on the habitat side of things are always going to want to be uh, less easy and focused on um, making sure the impacts don't happen. So there's the, the you know, we came to agreement on mitigation rules and land use rules, which were a big deal for people in the state. Um, once you move into implementation versus how things were gonna work in theory, things get a lot more difficult. And so um, we're weathering that and there are certain challenges related to it now and um, I mentioned that a bit, you know, the in lieu fee approach that Oregon has adopted. It sounds good. In, in practice, it's a lot more difficult to put together a habitat quantification tool instead of um, ways to get at a responsible in lieu fee program when, you know, now we're at that point of projects actually, when the rubber meets the road and projects are moving forward, the dynamics between um, development interests and county. Uh, county planning and county politics and, and kind of um, conservation really, they come to a head. Um, but I think overall I, on this slide, the bird habitat and trends, that's, that's the part of the weather that I think is um, the main ball to keep the eye on and the main kind of measure of success and failure. And, and on that point, um, next slide, please. We've, yeah, and Brett, just to let you know, uh, maybe just a couple more minutes and then we'll see if we have any questions. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been through some choppy waters um, and certainly still are on the bird and habitat trends, but what's kept things uh, together over time and what's come through in this partnership is that um, having a set of, uh, it's helpful to have a compass. And so having these boxes represent kind of the, the lens through which um, partners have agreed to view and measure whether um, the pressure to change, whether it's coming externally or from an internal partner as a proposed change, whether to embrace it and whether to, or whether to fight it or how excited to really get about it, how big of a deal is it really? And so it's a lens um, through which to assess change and, and um, it's also a glue. It's the, the kind of stuff that has the partnership together because it, it balances interests and um, creates some ballast where if something happens, litigation, for example, over um, predation control work, um, there's something that's still there and to come back to and that still holds people together. So next slide. And, and I think because of that, because of the, the um, foundational glue and the lens that people have you know, come come to it adds resilience and an ability to measure change or kind of reflect on where things are without a partnership coming apart. And because of that, groups that 
currently um, or traditionally would not hold hands together. They've continued to do that. Uh, so that this is a bit from the funding asked to the Oregon legislature. So implementation today, and I'll wrap up with this slide in the next one. Um, a bit of what it looks like. Um, action is happening and you know, there are plenty of challenges. And I think a lot of the presentations from day one set of panelists yesterday illustrate the challenges. Um, but there's also a lot of good stuff happening at the local level. And, um, you know, when I think about today's upset, today's focus and yesterday's obsession back in 2015, people were hugely focused on um, development threats and, and whether or how states would regulate that or on uh, the habitat designations and getting them right. And so today, you know, there's not much development happening in Oregon and we could, you know, there's a point in time where we could revisit the core area um, designations in Oregon. But I think for a lot of folks in the partnership, the focus is like, okay, well, are those really our biggest problems? And if they're not, where should we put the energy? And so today implementation is really about invasive annual grasses and the connection to wildfire and the connection to other states like the cheatgrass challenge in Idaho. Um, there are a lot of good examples to build upon and amplify and then gaps to fill. So the invasives effort, the SageCon invasives effort is really trying to do that is help bring capacity and coordination to um, good stuff that's already happening and that should be amplified and to fill gaps and meet challenges around um, juice that's needed. And so capacity and coordination are certainly part of that. Um, last bit on this is, this is a wicked problem and these things are gonna cost money. And I think um, that's a common focus of the, this partnership and implementation is, it's just not gonna be cheap and we need, um, legislatures and and other funders to kind of recognize that and go the distance. So last slide. Um, these are some lessons learned. Tom, when talking about this presentation, you know, he kind of reflected on, well, what would you say if others were thinking about um, doing a collaborative partnership or enhancing what they've already got? Um, we, we certainly don't have a coin on the realm here and we're learning as we go and there's still a lot to be learned, but some thoughts on um, what I'd share with others is are here. And um, you know, the, the implementation is more challenging, I think, than policy work. It's um, there's no one decider like a fish and wildlife service decision in 2015 that will wrap up a policy effort and put a stamp on it. Um, they're on implementation, it relies on a lot of coordination across a lot of different silos and then factors, wildfire, drought, beyond human control um, or less subject to it play a really challenging role that interrupt that space, whereas the policy space can be a little discreet and more carefully managed. Um, Nothing beats a crisis. So the two pictures here, one is the Paradise Fire, Paradise, California. The other one is the Martin Fire in Paradise Valley, Nevada. So you had two paradises on fire. And, um, you know, at the time, NASA had the Martin Fire as the biggest fire in the United States, some 600 plus square miles. But all the attention, I mean, how many people really remember that outside of this? Um, maybe this is a unique group, but everybody focused on the Paradise California fire. And, you know, I think that has a lot to do with when you've got a human element to the crisis and human beings or communities suffering, it, it, it amplifies attention a lot more. And um, there's certainly a habitat and a bird population concern that people could call a crisis right now, but it's the human element that I think really generates um, the momentum. And so to that third bullet, um, I think a lot of people flock to the policy work because there's often a crisis notion around it. Like we got to do something if we're going to address this ESA determination. When that goes away or when the crisis goes away, it's a lot harder um, to, to motivate or generate that sense of crisis around implementation. And um, we've seen that in Oregon. We've seen declining levels of legislative investment in the action plan. And I think that has a lot to do with um, 
how do you work your human story into your collaboration? Because I think it's the human side that can really drive a notion of urgency and momentum in, um, you know, what, what many folks on here may look at as a, uh, a conservation problem for a bird and habitat. It's, it's the human side that I think really motivates. So the last, the last one is, um, the last two, I'll do it real quick, Susan. Um, policy actors, it's, they're different than implementation actors and it's not just a matter of psyche or, or people's affinity. Um, it's also organizational structure and skills and capacity. And I, I don't say that as a bad thing. I just think it's a, uh, something to recognize it's important to find the right implementation actors to show up at implementation tables and they're not always going to be the same as the policy side um and then the last one is yeah maybe more true in um contexts that have a long history of conflict like the sagebrush wars but there's no pure line between policy and implementation and um it's just hard to focus on implementation alone the thing that people are often trying to implement is usually connected to a policy space or a history that involves controversy in um and it shapes the culture around uh the implementation of the workspace so and the actors that show up and so um where you've got issues that connect different communities like dealing with invasives and wildfire it's really a great thing um because you can uh overcome some of the larger you know, culture war type things that that um, get blown up in the sagebrush wars, and and you've got some elements that can provide some common ground. So with that, I'll wrap and um, and just say thank you. The last slide here, um, if we can go to that real quick, are just some uh, links to uh, what Oregon and the SageCon partnership is and and what we're doing. So with that, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Brett. That was a very interesting presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, so I am looking right now. We just have a few minutes left. We have a little bit of information to provide before, uh, before we wrap up, but I want to pause and see if we have any questions for Brett. So I'm looking to see if anyone has their hand raised or has submitted a written question. Does anyone? Not seeing any hands raised or written questions yet. It's been a little quieter this afternoon on the question front, <laughs> but I certainly want to give people an opportunity if they have a question for you. Susan, this is Tom uh, Remington. As a panelist, I don't have the opportunity to type in questions, but I did have one uh, for Brett and Brett. Thanks for that presentation. Uh, you earned yourself a spot on the increasing capacity uh, work group. With oh, no. <laughs> Um, the question I had, you, you talked about policy and implementation, uh, no clear line. And with adaptive management constructs, there probably shouldn't be because the monitoring in, of, of the implementation should feed back and, and modify the policy or at least the plan. Uh, I saw you had a bullet that talked about monitoring. Is there an adaptive management construct with SageCon or the governor's plan? There, yeah, there is, and it's in the state action plan. And I mean, one thing I didn't emphasize is the it's not just the state's action plan, but the partnership is trying to also make sure things are coordinated with BLM plans and then local county planning. But yeah, there is on the monitoring end and adaptive management. How it's being done, though, um, you know, we at the SageCon partnership level are not the actors, and so we have uh, technical staff and monitoring support that brings the actors together into coordinated works monitoring workspace meetings where those kinds of conversations and discussions happen including like what are we learning from you know the nature conservancy for example has been doing a lot of seed technology research and others have been doing um, weed treatment and bunch grass community restoration work so we, we we set the table for the spaces where the conversations happen around what are we learning and then how should that feed back into adjusting management plans and actions on the ground? And by having the right agency implementation actors and kind of uh, landowner type connections through SWCDs there, that's how that uh, is intended to go back out to the ground. Okay, thanks, great. Hey, 
Don't go away, Tom. I'm going to be calling on you in just a minute. All right, Brett, again, thank you so much for presenting and sure. responding to Tom's question. And um, I think you are involved in a breakout group next week. So we'll look forward to connecting with you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have reached uh, the end of our afternoon session for the case studies. Really, really appreciate all of the uh, presenters and uh, just the great information they brought uh, forward. And I think it's a it will be very provocative for the conversation we have next week. And Tom, you may want to say more about that here in just a minute. I'd like to give you a chance just to make some closing comments. So mine are really uh, just to be sure to remind folks that uh, if you are involved in one of the breakout groups, if you're an active participant, you should have received an email uh, that uh, let you know that. And if you are a listener or a, um, a more of a passive participant in a breakout group, you should have received an email about that as well. And we're sorry to limit participation, but we think this will make for a better conversation. And then ultimately uh, in, on June 8th and after, there will be an opportunity for everybody to jump in and provide feedback and comments on the work that was done at this uh, online workshop and just, just carry things further. So everyone will get more opportunities to weigh in on things. Uh, the other thing to remind is for those that are in the breakout groups, on May 11th, please go to this uh, Sagebrush Conservation Workshop at par or .participate.online site and you will find uh, the different topical areas and you'll be able to find the materials for each of those breakout groups. So please remember to take a look at that on May 11th. Uh, so Tom, um, would like to give you a chance to make any kind of closing remarks on this uh, second day of the online workshop. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Uh, I'd just like to thank the speakers today. Uh, great presentations. I think Pat and I uh, concluded our presentation yesterday by saying, um, stay tuned, the answers are out there and we're gonna hear about a number of them tomorrow, um, today. And I think that was the case. I, I, I was frankly inspired and if it wouldn't be uh, inappropriate and uh, potentially violate social distancing guidelines, I'd like to reach out and hug each one of them for the, the good work that they're doing. You, you almost do get emotional um, learning about these things and, um, it, it's our challenge, I think, next week to figure out how we, if we could bottle that and put those kinds of implementation programs in place across the sagebrush biome, we'd have this thing whipped. Um, if we had a Douglas core area restoration team for every 68,000 acres of sagebrush, and if we had the kind of uh, coordinated approach that they're working on in Idaho with the cheatgrass challenge or that we saw in Oregon where you know, they have so many collaborative conservation groups, they have to have a collaborative umbrella for the collaborative groups. And then they have another collaborative umbrella at the statewide level. Uh, we need that for the biome. So for those of you that are you know, listening, thank you for hanging in there. Uh, it's been a, a, a long but interesting two days. Uh, if you're working on efforts at a local level, think about how these examples and the other ones that we didn't have presentations on, but were in the printed material. Um, you know, how can we make that happen at local scales? And for those of you that are working at larger scales at, at state levels or programmatic responsibilities at larger scales, how do we coordinate these activities so that what we heard today is not random acts of kindness, but rather a directed acts that lead to a, a collective whole. And that, that's sort of what keeps me up at night right now. But anyway, thanks to you and your staff, I think with a, a couple of very minor exceptions, this went really well. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tom. And thanks, everyone, for listening in. And we will uh, sign off now, uh, except for the team. Hang on for just a minute, the planning team. And uh, the rest of you, have a nice rest of your day and evening. And we hope to be interacting with uh, many of you next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>